Chapter 226, Kishin's Measures In Tokyo, Japan, the KS1 and its video games became a prevailing trend. Within a few weeks of its release, sales reached an estimated 500,000. Initially, Tora and Suzuki speculated that Kishin was selling the KS1 at a loss. However, they foresaw that the profit wouldn't come directly from the console, priced at 29,800 yen or 280 US dollars. It was only after the surge in KS1 video game sales that Kishin began to see a profit. This strategy mirrors Tora and Suzuki's previous approach, where they lowered the console price to boost video game sales and subsequently increase overall profitability. While KS1 dominated the Japanese market for about a month, it's essential not to overlook the presence of KS or SKES. In Tokyo, Japan, the KS1 and its video games became a prevailing trend. Within a few weeks of its release, sales reached an estimated 500,000. Initially, Tora and Suzuki speculated that Kishin was selling the KS1 at a loss. However, they foresaw that the profit wouldn't come directly from the console, priced at 29,800 yen or 280 US dollars. It was only after the surge in KS1 video game sales that Kishin began to see a profit. This strategy mirrors Tora and Suzuki's previous approach, where they lowered the console price to boost video game sales and subsequently increase overall profitability. While KS1 dominated the Japanese market for about a month, it's essential not to overlook the presence of KS or SKES. Following the price reductions of KES and SKES, a broad audience, including those unfamiliar with video games, embraced the consoles. This led to a surge in Kishin video game sales for KES and SKES, and the undeniable profitability of these platforms. Some newcomers to gaming, who initially lacked time or were hesitant to spend extensively, discovered the allure of video games after the price drop for KES and SKES, providing them the opportunity to delve into Kishin's gaming offerings. Initially skeptical, these individuals, now immersed in gaming, found that the enthusiasm of video game fans was not exaggerated. Remarkably, despite using the older KES or SKES and not the latest Kishin console, KS1, they found genuine enjoyment in gaming. Dash. Simultaneously, KS1 video games, particularly Resident Evil, garnered significant attention within the gaming community. It was genuinely terrifying. Some players, caught in the intensity, couldn't help but exclaim, Yabai. Dash. In various arcade sections, KS1-based arcade machines found their place within weeks of the KS1 release. The Resident Evil and Kishin All-Stars Racing arcade machines garnered considerable attention. Ha ha ha, I loved Sonic's skill, running with his car. A young man remarked to his friend, currently engrossed in Kishin All-Stars Racing. His friend, still playing, smiled and replied, Honestly, Sonic could just step out of the car and easily outpace the racers, he <laughs> he. As per the Sonic the Hedgehog story manual, he can move so swiftly, ranging from 300 to 767 miles per hour, surpassing the speed of any cars in the video game. The arcade was bustling with people, and with the gradual rise in popularity of video games, arcades in various stores and malls expanded as well. Upon the release of Kishin's latest video game console, anticipation lingered for the introduction of corresponding arcade machines. As expected, within a few weeks, Kishin delivered new arcade machines tailored to their cutting-edge console. Currently, within the arcade section, each line is dedicated to KS1 arcade machines featuring specific video game lineups. The arrangement consists of a line of KS1 arcade machines running a particular KS1 video game lineup together, while another set of KS1 arcade machines, featuring a different video game, has its own distinct line with just a bit of space in between. With seats occupied, some young people patiently waited while observing others engaged in arcade gaming. The standout among the video games that captured their interest the most in the arcade was Resident Evil. The video game proved to be both captivating and chilling, particularly with its third-person perspective gameplay. It truly grabbed the attention of the young audience, especially during scenes where the zombie turned its head towards the camera, creating an eerie effect as if it were looking directly at them. Some even felt a shiver, and if not for the lively arcade atmosphere, a few might have been genuinely spooked. It didn't disappoint me, chuckled Nobuhiro, a current college student. Despite aspiring to become a manga artist, he often indulged in video games during his free time, whether it be on KES or SKES. Playing these games served as a wellspring of inspiration for his manga artistry. When Kishin, the corporation his crush hoped to work for, unveiled KS1, Nobuhiro was among the excited individuals. However, despite his enthusiasm, financial constraints prevented him from purchasing one. Consequently, he could only watch with envy as others enjoyed the gaming experience, all the while immersing himself in his dreams of a successful career and college life. Upon learning from his elder brother that KS1 video games were available in arcades, he promptly headed to the arcade, and here he is currently engrossed in playing Resident Evil. While he typically favored video games like Super Mario and The Legend of Zelda, Resident Evil wasn't bad, it just didn't evoke enough fear. Being honest, he admitted a stronger preference for video games on KES or SKES. After all, the 2D pixelated aesthetics of those games seemed more visually pleasing than the KS1 video games, which used 2D with pre-rendered backgrounds to create a 3D effect. 
Nobuhiro still held a fondness for the video games from his senior high school days, back when Kishin was just starting to gain a bit of recognition. It all began with Super Mario, the intriguing and captivating 2D pixelated video games remained Nobuhiro's current preference. He wasn't alone in this sentiment. Some video game enthusiasts who purchased KS1 also found the limited selection of 3 KS1 video games in the market to be quickly monotonous. Some even expressed the hope that Kishin could, at the very least, port some KS and SKES video games to KS1. Before they knew it, Kishin indeed made it happen by porting KES and SKES video games to KS1 on CDs. Although these CD games were relatively expensive, each CD contained 5 KES or SKES video games, providing users with a variety according to their preferences. A compilation of KES or SKES video game titles was released for KS1, eliciting satisfaction from players who favored those classics. While Kishin and other video game entertainment companies were still in the process of developing games specifically for KS1, the existing library of KES or SKES video games would serve to keep fans' content for a considerable duration. Among the recently ported titles from SKES to KS1 were Super Punch-Out, Kirby's Dream Land 1 and 2, and a set of sequels for Street Fighter, among others. These games constituted part of the final lineup released by Kishin for SKES before the advent of KS1. While some fans in the video game communities had concerns that Kishin might abandon the development of 2D pixelated games in favor of the new KS1 style, their worries were soon alleviated. Kishin released a video game for KS1 that retained the 2D pixelated style reminiscent of SKES but featured an expanded color palette due to its 32-bit capability. This game, titled Mortal Kombat, not only addressed the concerns of those nostalgic for the classic 2D pixelated format but also showcased the advancements made possible by the KS1 platform. Chapter 227, Mortal Kombat when the television advertisement for the KS1 version of Mortal Kombat aired, viewers were pleasantly surprised. The game, akin to Street Fighter, distinguished itself through its narrative. According to the commercial, the storyline revolved around the clash between Earthrealm and Outworld. The graphics, along with the character sprites showcased in the advertisement, created a lifelike impression of real people brought to animated existence. The gameplay mirrored the fighting dynamics of Street Fighter on KES and SKES, with the key distinction lying in superior graphics. Whether the fighting experience surpassed Street Fighter remained to be seen, as players had yet to engage with the game themselves. When Mortal Kombat debuted at Akihabara Kishin store, a considerable number of eager buyers had already formed a line. While the queues didn't match the length seen during the KS1 sales, there was still a substantial crowd demonstrating keen interest in the new video game. Following the lineup of KS1 video games, Mortal Kombat emerged as the sole new release after approximately a month and two weeks. Days later, as enthusiastic video game fans purchased and played it at home, they found themselves pleasantly surprised by both the graphics and gameplay. Initially, the menu presented a variety of options, including tournaments and battles with player 2. Opting for the tournament feature, players selected their characters and engaged in battles against computer opponents, reminiscent of Street Fighter. However, this time, the standout differences were the enhanced graphics and 2D rendering featured in the game. Notably, Mortal Kombat distinguished itself as a fighting video game with elements of blood and gore. Adding to its allure was the presence of a more hype-inducing announcer compared to Street Fighter. In the video game Mortal Kombat, upon selecting the tournament, a cinematic intro unfolded, so convincingly crafted that had it not been a video game, it could easily be mistaken for a Kishin film. Following the film-like intro, character selection ensued, accompanied by the announcer's declaration before the battle commenced, unveiling the battle plan. As the player's battle initiated, the announcer's iconic proclamation echoed, Round 1, Fight. In moments of close victory, the announcer intensified the excitement with phrases like finish her, or finish him, with fatality, being a favorite among video game fans. These lines, including animality and more, added an extra layer of hype for players, amplified by the enhanced sound effects accompanying every punch and kick. While Mortal Kombat garnered player approval, the film-like intro sparked widespread discussion among video game enthusiasts. Many felt that the intro possessed cinematic potential comparable to scenes in films like Resident Evil. The zombie head-turning scene from Resident Evil, though not filmed in real life, served as a benchmark. However, the cinematic execution and acting in the Resident Evil story intro failed to impress players. Diverging from the cinematic story intros of Mortal Kombat, featuring the game's announcer as the narrator, players perceived it not merely as an introduction to the video game but as a serious cinematic piece. The gravity of the actors' performances and actions in the fighting scenes conveyed a level of seriousness that, if not for the awareness that it was a video game, could be mistaken for a genuinely serious film scene. Despite not being avid film enthusiasts, players found themselves compelled to discuss their observations with friends. A 30-year-old man, recently acquiring the Mortal Kombat video game, remarked to his colleagues, Hey, didn't you notice how seriously the Mortal Kombat story intro was filmed? It's unlike the Resident Evil story intro. I find it intriguing. If Kishin ever plans to make a film adaptation of Mortal Kombat, I hope it maintains the same quality as that Mortal Kombat story intro. 
I agree, but simultaneously, I doubt that if Kishin decides to adapt one of their video games into a film, it might not achieve the same quality, not even matching the level of their KS1 video game story intros, one of them remarked. I'm specifically referring to the Mortal Kombat story intro, clarified the 30-year-old man. I understand, but what I'm emphasizing is that a full-length film, stretching to an hour or so, may struggle to maintain the same quality seen in that brief story intro of the Mortal Kombat video game, the individual added, shaking his head. Well, maybe you're right, the 30-year-old man nodded and added with hope, I'm just interested to see the result if it ever gets filmed, you know. The story intro of the video game Mortal Kombat was good as a story intro, but I don't think we could expect much from a full-length film, another guy remarked. That's true. Following that, the colleagues delved into discussing the intriguing combos they could execute in Mortal Kombat. I'll be honest, I prefer the fighting gameplay style of Mortal Kombat over Street Fighter, a man said with a smile. Yeah, Mortal Kombat just conveys a sense of violence and brutality compared to Street Fighter, someone agreed. Well, maybe Street Fighter was geared towards kids, and the new fighting video game from Kishin, Mortal Kombat, is more for adults who appreciate the visceral elements, another speculated. It wasn't restricted beyond 7, chimed in another. Not so surprising. The blood looks fake and all. It should at least be restricted, right? Or is Kishin just too influential now, a man couldn't help but question. You're only realizing that now, another said with a chuckle. Ha ha ha. They couldn't help but laugh. Little did the new Mortal Kombat fans know that Kishin had actually incorporated scenes from their upcoming film Mortal Kombat into the video game itself. In Hollywood, the film project went by the name Fighter's Destiny. Surprisingly, no one knew that the film project had already been adapted into the video games before its official release. The Mortal Kombat film project began when Shin observed that the Marvel Spider-Man film faced delays due to casting issues, with Stan Lee being particularly selective. After Shin granted Stan Lee the authority to cast the main actors, Lee took the task seriously, displaying a meticulous approach. During this time, Shin invested in studios equipped with green screens and film production resources. Given the nature of Marvel's requirements, many scenes would likely involve costly CGI. Chapter 228, Kadabra. After the release of KS1 in Japan, video game enthusiasts in the United States were just discovering its existence. Damn it! Why didn't the media cover the release of KS1, the latest video game console from Kishin? A blonde man slammed his hand into the wooden table in frustration. Well, I'm not really blaming the media, but rather Kishin. They only decided to announce now that their latest console has been released in Japan, another person said, trying to calm his blonde friend. Actually, a friend of mine mentioned that KS1 and its video games were featured in some gaming magazines. Although I enjoy video games, I rarely buy gaming-themed magazines, I prefer the more matured ones, added a black-haired man. I feel the same way, their chubby friend chimed in, bringing a moment of silence. Later, one of the guys broke the quiet by saying, even if we were aware of Kishin's latest video game console, the KS1, it wouldn't have mattered since it wasn't available in the USA yet. That's true, everyone agreed. Perhaps Kishin delayed announcing the KS1 in the USA to prevent disappointment among American gamers. Well, let's just play Chrono Trigger, suggested one of the guys, and everyone nodded as they headed to their hub. This time, the once proud group of video game players looked somewhat miserable as they played on SKES. While they still enjoyed the game, the knowledge of another console, the KS1, being out there left them feeling a bit dissatisfied. After all, they'd have to wait a few months, probably until November or December, as Kishin didn't provide an exact date but mentioned it would be a few months after the release in Japan, before KS1 becomes available in the USA and other parts of Asia. Meanwhile, in New York, a man with thick, naturally wavy black hair parted on the left side of his head specifically sporting a short back and side style was en route to the president's office. Employed at D.E. Shaw & Co., a hedge fund company, the man held the position of vice president. Initially, he worked as a computer engineer at the hedge fund company, focusing on designing and developing algorithms used by D.E. Shaw & Co. for trading stocks, bonds, and various financial instruments. Additionally, he was responsible for maintaining the training system. Impressed by his skills, the higher UPS were satisfied, leading to a salary raise. Over the years, the man ascended through the ranks, ultimately reaching the position of vice president. However, the man sensed that something was missing. Although his current role at the company involved easier tasks than before, focusing on strategizing for the company, he harbored personal ambitions and dreams. With the advent of the internet, the man foresaw its potential, sparking a compelling idea that consumed his thoughts. As the idea lingered in his mind, he found it difficult to sleep at night. Despite jotting down his thoughts on paper, he initially believed it would suffice to bring him peace. Yet, after a few days, the idea persisted, and he couldn't ignore it any longer. Realizing that his subconscious mind was signaling something crucial, he understood that a mere plan on paper wouldn't be enough. Actions were required to bring his idea to fruition. Hence, he found himself on the way to the president's office, intending to submit a resignation letter. After knocking on the door and entering his boss's office, the president, named David E. Shaw, was in the midst of organizing the company's portfolio. David looked up and identified his talented employee, furrowing his brows but asking, Oh, Vice President Jeff, what brings you here? 
Jeff, holding a paper, walked to the front of his boss and stated, Mr. Shaw, I am here to submit my resignation. He placed the paper on his boss's desk. David frowned and questioned, you're resigning. Jeff nodded in affirmation. David furrowed his brows and inquired, is it because you're uncomfortable with the company, or perhaps you're dissatisfied with the salary? Jeff shook his head and replied, no, not at all. The workspace is fine, and I've learned a lot here. The salary is also quite good. Confused, David asked, then why? Why are you resigning? Jeff smiled and said, I want to pursue my own dream. Upon hearing this, David was slightly surprised. He looked at Jeff, chuckled wryly, and remarked, I can't stop a man's dream, can I? Jeff just smiled as David patted him on the shoulder. Just remember, if you fail, you can always return to this company. David said this, but deep inside, he felt a twinge of regret that his company would be losing a skilled individual. Filling Jeff's role as vice president, given his four years of expertise as a computer engineer and his proven success in the company, would undoubtedly be challenging. After resigning, Jeff headed to his house in Upper West Side Manhattan. Upon arriving home, he shared his plan to start a company with his wife. His wife, currently juggling various part-time jobs despite being an experienced novelist and researcher, had some of her books published by a bookstore named Rookie, which offered better deals than most others. I'm thinking of building a website, specifically an online bookstore, Jeff explained to his wife. Scott nodded, furrowing her brows, and responded, okay, but I don't think it's such a unique idea. There have been several online shopping platforms, and that isn't limited to books alone. Jeff smiled and explained, I know, but that's not the point. The goal is to gather data on customer preferences whether it's their information, preferred books, or even their ideal prices, etc. My plan isn't just to create an ordinary online bookstore, rather, it's to build a framework with a data algorithm that predicts customer preferences. With that, we could enhance the overall customer experience. Upon hearing her husband's ideas, Scott felt that his concept was innovative and unique. While online shopping was already established on the internet, she doubted whether other companies had incorporated such a sophisticated data algorithm into their frameworks. What do you plan to name your company? Jeff's wife inquired. Jeff responded, Kadabra. Kadabra Incorporated. Pausing to explain, he added, Kadabra is a magic word that signifies appearing out of nowhere, much like our online bookstore where books will magically find their way to customers through delivery. His wife posed a critical question, asking, should we reach out to book publishers to have their books sold on our Kadabra? Will anyone be willing to participate? Pausing at her question, Jeff returned with his own inquiry, stating, I heard that you've already published some of your books with a bookstore named Rookie. Observing his wife nod, he continued, while they offer better terms compared to other publishers, they're experiencing financial losses. Most of their books, primarily novels from Japan, aren't generating enough revenue. Even though Rookie is owned by Kishin, a renowned company, they aren't providing any promotion for the bookstore, resulting in financial setbacks. His wife nodded in understanding. Jeff proposed, this seems like a bookstore that deserves attention, right? Why don't we negotiate with Rookie and make their books available on our future site, Kadabra? Chapter 229, Opportunity. After Jeff resigned a few days ago, he established a company called Kadabra Incorporated with the support of his wife. He reached out to friends, forming a group of angel investors to potentially fund his venture. Following this, they initiated discussions with Rookie Bookstore to explore the possibility of featuring their books on the online platform they envisioned. Jeff and his wife visited the Rookie Bookstore in Manhattan. While the bookstore appeared typical at first glance, it stood out with its exceptional cleanliness and a Japanese word, Rookie, displayed on the board. This bookstore seems to embody the precision and orderliness of Japanese culture, Jeff remarked. His wife agreed with a nod as they entered, perusing the new releases, bestsellers, and staff picks on display. Inside, a central aisle connected various sections throughout the store. After Jeff resigned a few days ago, he established a company called Kadabra Incorporated with the support of his wife. He reached out to friends, forming a group of angel investors to potentially fund his venture. Following this, they initiated discussions with Rookie Bookstore to explore the possibility of featuring their books on the online platform they envisioned. Jeff and his wife visited the Rookie Bookstore in Manhattan. While the bookstore appeared typical at first glance, it stood out with its exceptional cleanliness and a Japanese word, Rookie, displayed on the board. This bookstore seems to embody the precision and orderliness of Japanese culture, Jeff remarked. His wife agreed with a nod as they entered, perusing the new releases, bestsellers, and staff picks on display. Inside, a central aisle connected various sections throughout the store. At the checkout counter, a blonde woman sat engrossed in a book as Jeff and his wife approached. Upon noticing their approach, she lifted her head and greeted them, Is there anything I can assist you with? Jeff nodded, saying, This is my wife, Scoff Mackenzie, a novelist who publishes her books in rookie bookstores. The woman acknowledged with a nod, prompting Jeff's wife to introduce herself. Following this, the woman asked, how may I assist you? Expressing their desire to meet the manager, the woman at the counter seemed slightly surprised and inquired about the reason. Jeff and his wife simply explained it was for business purposes. The woman inferred that their intention was likely to discuss matters related to Jeff's wife's books with the manager. Following their meeting, Jeff and his wife engaged in discussions with the stout manager of the bookstore regarding Jeff's business proposal. 
Despite the initial inclination of the manager to dismiss the idea, recognizing his role as a mere manager within the larger framework of Rookie Bookstores, a publishing company under a substantial corporation, he opted to seek approval from higher authorities. Deciding to inform the higher UPS about Jeff's proposal, the manager relayed the information to the executives of Rookie Publisher Company, who then reported it to Rookie Suzuki, the CEO of Rookie Publisher Company. Dash. In Tokyo, Japan, at the Rookie Publisher Company headquarters in Minato Ward, the building stood modestly amidst its surroundings. Within the CEO's office, Rookie Suzuki received a report from the U.S. executives of Rookie Publisher about Jeff Jorgensen. The report detailed Jeff's suggestion to sell Rookie Books online through a website he had created. She found Jeff's idea intriguing, yet concurrently believed it prudent to consult with her fourth brother. Considering that Shinro Suzuki's company was the parent company of Rookie Publisher Company and also provided funding for her own company, her decision to discuss the matter with him was logical. Notably, Shinro Suzuki had founded Rookie Publisher Company and appointed her as CEO, a decision that had initially left her perplexed. Dialing her fourth brother's number, she scrutinized the information on her computer sent by the executives via the internet the file being Jeff Jorgensen's proposal. Dash. At Kishin Rules headquarters, Shin conveyed his ideas on a whiteboard to a group of attentive game developers seated around a round table, diligently taking notes on Shin's words regarding the video game direction plan portfolio. Midway through this discussion, Shin's phone interrupted the meeting with a ring. Oops. Excuse me, guys, Shin said, retrieving his phone from his pocket. He distanced himself before answering the call. Hello, sister rookie. Shin inquired as he picked up the phone. Fourth brother, I called you regarding. Rookie began, explaining the situation to Shin. Listening attentively, Shin became somewhat astonished as he learned about a man proposing to feature rookie bookstore books on a website for online sales. It wasn't the concept of an online store that surprised him, but rather the man's name and his company. The man shared the same name as someone from Shin's previous life the founder of Amazon, if his memory served him right. Without hesitation, Shin instructed his second sister, Rookie, to endorse the man's proposal. After the call concluded, Shin gazed at the phone for a moment, deep in thought. I should be ready to secure another round of funding. I need to seize the opportunity immediately, Shin contemplated. Drawing from his knowledge of his previous life, he recalled that, apart from Jeff, the Vanguard Group Incorporated was the largest shareholder in Amazon. Shin also entertained the idea of acquiring Jeff's company. However, considering that Jeff's venture wasn't widely recognized or successful yet, and factoring in Jeff's ambitious goals, it seemed unlikely that Jeff would be willing to sell even if the company faced initial challenges. Shin recognized that Jeff possessed a long-term vision. From Shin's perspective, Jeff prioritized the development of the algorithmic data over immediate profitability, aligning with a broader plan he was formulating. Had Shin not known better, he might have perceived Jeff as merely a crazy and overly optimistic individual. However, Shin understood that the man was highly calculated, optimistic, and driven by a clear purpose. A person with such qualities would not easily part with their company. If he were to sell, he wouldn't be Jeff Jorgensen, Shin pondered. Dash. Meanwhile, with anime series like Pokemon, Dragon Ball, Earthbound, and Yu-Gi-Oh gaining popularity not only in Japan but internationally, Kishin merchandise seized the opportunity. On July 30, 1994, the company organized an event in Akihabara, capturing the attention of anime fans. It was a Casa Pure event, centered around participants donning anime character costumes, embodying the characters through both attire and mannerisms. Those who excelled would be eligible for awards and rewards from Kishin merchandise. Kishin merchandise had been selling anime character clothing for some time, but it was only now that Shinro Suzuki's idea was set into motion. In Akihabara's electric town, where thousands of square meters had already been cleared for construction, work came to a halt to accommodate Kishin merchandise's event. The flat area was transformed with stages and vendors to create the necessary space. This marked the beginning of Kishin's strategy to elevate Akihabara's prominence, starting locally in Japan. By associating the event with anime, the aim was to attract not only a domestic audience but also foreign visitors to the area. This marks the beginning of Kishin's initiative to elevate Akihabara's status, aiming for recognition, at least within Japan initially. By associating the event with anime, it also intends to draw in foreign visitors. Chapter 230, Upcoming Event The Kishin merchandise's Kasapure sparked discussions among anime fans across Japan. A young man in a sharp high school black suit entered the classroom. His friends chatted while other classmates focused on their tasks, and the teacher had yet to arrive. As Yamazaki Michi joined his friends, one of them mentioned, Yamazaki-kun, did you hear about Kishin's latest event? Perplexed, Yamazaki Michi responded, event. He furrowed his brows and asked, is it a video game tournament? His friend, Nato Sango, shook his head. No, it's about anime. Anime. Yamazaki Michi sounded confused. Nato Sango nodded. Exactly. It's about dressing up and embodying characters from Kishin's popular anime. As an anime fan, Yamazaki Michi was astonished. An event where you dress as a Kishin anime character. Nato Sango and his friends nodded in confirmation. He continued, that's right. If you dress better and portray the character well in the competition, you might even win awards and rewards. Isn't it interesting, Yamazaki-kun? The event kicks off on August 3, 1994. 
I'll be dressing up as Yuji Muto from Yu-Gi-Oh, then I'll be Honda. Yamazaki Michi and Nato Sango overheard their friends already discussing their roles and anime costumes. The most popular character will probably be Yuji Muto, and both Yamazaki Michi and Nato Sango preferred Yuji Muto too. Why are most of us choosing Yuji Muto? Yamazaki Michi couldn't help but ask with a wry chuckle. Nato Sango smiled and said, Do we need to ask? Because he's cool. A bullied young man being cool? Haha. <laughs> One of their friends, a Pokemon fan, mocked with a chuckle. You didn't watch Yu-Gi-Oh, did you? Another one of Yamazaki Michi and Nato Sango's friends remarked. Nah, I watched it, but the main character's hairstyle is a bit much. You're judging Yu-Gi-Oh? Because of a hairstyle. Of course not. Pokemon is just better. Better? No, I think Yu-Gi-Oh is better. It has a dark tone from the first episode alone. Just because it has a dark tone doesn't mean it's better. Pokemon is much better and also more popular. Alright. Being popular doesn't mean it's better. And besides, just wait for a few more years, and everyone in the world will have heard of Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah, dream on. Yamazaki Michi and Nato Sango looked at each other and Riley chuckled as their friends engaged in another debate on which anime is superior. In Yamazaki and Nato Sango's opinion, Yu-Gi-Oh surpasses Pokemon and delves into mature themes, such as an episode where the main character, Yuji Muto, faces discipline from a strict leader, Ushio. The portrayal of self-righteous figures like Ushio reflects realities in some Japanese schools. While rumors connect school bullies to the Yakuza, the speculation holds a grain of truth, adding an intriguing layer to the narrative. The anime's main character, Yuji Mutu, serves as an inspiration to Japanese youth, resonating especially with those in Tokyo who share a love for games. Given that Yuji Mutu's family owns a game shop, some Yu-Gi-Oh! fans speculate that Shinro Suzuki based the character on himself. Many Kishin enthusiasts consider this an unofficial fact, reinforced by the anime's title, Yu-Gi-Oh!, translating to Game King or King of Games. If that doesn't say something, they're unsure what will. Hence, many people essentially accepted a notion without Shin's knowledge, the anime Yu-Gi-Oh, along with its main character, was based on him. While Shin remained oblivious to this developing consensus about himself, even those close to him felt that the anime Yu-Gi-Oh was rooted in his persona. Dash. At the Yamauchigomi headquarters, a traditional Japanese mansion, Yakuza men gathered in the Japanese hall, with Obiyu at the center. Kasa pure, huh. Obiyu mused, holding Yu-Gi-Oh cards. That's right. It's happening in Akihabara, and I plan to participate, said a Yakuza member already dressed as Ushio. Then I'll take the role of Honda, a man with a formal hairstyle declared. I'll be Ness, a Yakuza member holding a Game Boy announced. I'm going to be Ox King. As the Yakuza members discussed, one of them asked Obiyu, what about you, Oyabun? Obiyu stroked his chin in contemplation and replied, I'm still thinking. What about Yuji Muta, suggested one of the Yakuza members. Silence fell over the group as Obiyu looked at the member who made the suggestion. He then stated, are you ignorant? Yuji Muto is the character I will not take, and none of you should either. Ah, uh, is it because Yuji Muto's character is weak and not manly at all? The Yakuza member named Ryuji, who made the suggestion, couldn't help but ask. Being new to the Yamauchigomi meeting, he was unfamiliar with the dynamics. Most Yakuza members looked at Ryuji, some shaking their heads. Obiyu turned his gaze towards Ryuji and slammed his hand on the table. Of course not because he is weak. Besides, he wasn't entirely weak. Yuji Muto, especially Yami Yuji, is the character I admire the most. Ah, uh, then, why? Ryuji couldn't help but ask. Obiyu locked eyes with Ryuji and explained, it's because Yuji Muto, especially Yami Yuji, is based on the king of games himself, the Kishinsama Shinro Suzuki. Observing Ryuji's confusion, Obiyu continued, the Yami Yuji seen in the first episode of Yu-Gi-Oh, I believe to be Shinro Suzuki's way of conveying his true and formidable character through Yami Yuji in the anime. As he explained, his tone carried a hint of excitement. The sentiment echoed among almost every Yakuza old member in the hall. Sato and Ryuji exchanged glances. They had recently joined the Yakuza core member gatherings and were still new to the dynamics. They couldn't help but feel a bit shocked at the fervent worship these individuals had for Shinro Suzuki. I just spoke to Kishin-sama, and he informed me that he'll take on the role of Yami Yuji in the event, Obiyu announced, a revelation that didn't surprise most of the Yakuza members. Shinro Suzuki will also join the first Kasa Pure event, as stated in the announcement. This is why it has immediately captured the attention of many people. Chapter 231, Kasa Pure Event Shin took on the role of Yami Yuji, a suggestion from Myra who believed it suited him well. Although initially hesitant about the hairstyle, professional assistants transformed it to resemble Yuji from Yu-Gi-Oh, and Shin found the overall look surprisingly decent. Donned in Yuji's attire, Shin resembled an adult version of the character. Turning to Myra, who was cosplaying as Bulma from Dragon Ball with turquoise hair matching the characters, Shin asked, What do you think? Myra, impressed by Shin's Yami Yuji costume, remarked, You look pretty good. Shin, in turn, complimented Myra's Bulma cosplay and suggested, why don't we exercise alone in our room while you're still in the Bulma role? Myra blushed slightly upon hearing Shin's suggestion, nodding in agreement. All right, as long as you keep yours too, she replied, her gaze fixed on Shin, who was currently cosplaying as Yami Yuji. Shin chuckled at her response. Oh, you want me to cosplay as Yami Yuji as well, very naughty, 
he teased, prompting a blush from Myra as she playfully nudged him. Dash. On August 3, 1994, in Akihabara, on a flat, cleared space, the Kishin Merchandise Casa Pure event unfolded. Vendors were set up, the venue adorned with decorations, and the Kishin stage drew a bustling crowd. Among the attendees were foreigners, a group of American friends chatting animatedly. Dressed as Kishin anime or video game characters, they noticed a Japanese person cosplaying as Misty. Intrigued, they commented, guys, look, that guy's costume is Misty. The group admired the cute Japanese portrayal of Misty, with one of them expressing, Asians are so damn cute. Their attention then shifted to a Japanese woman confidently wearing Samu's Aaron's provocative Justin Bailey suit. Oh, the foreigners couldn't help but be visibly excited. Throughout the event, participants showcased costumes not only from anime characters but also from renowned Kishin video games like Super Mario, The Legend of Zelda, featuring characters like Link or Zelda, among others. The most captivating sights were the fit and beautiful Japanese women donning costumes of famous female characters from Kishin's anime or video games. Some Yakuza members maintained a low profile while showcasing their costumes, unaware that undercover police officers, also disguised as famous anime or video game characters, closely monitored them. Simultaneously, the TV Asahi team captured the lively event and its numerous participants, contributing to the bustling atmosphere among the thousands in attendance. Anticipation heightened as many eagerly awaited the appearance of Shinro Suzuki. Participants stayed committed to their role characters while the crowd eagerly waited. Then, a deep Japanese voice announced, Let's welcome Yami Yuji. Surprise rippled through the crowd as the announcer revealed the character name from Yu-Gi-Oh. However, their astonishment turned into cheers when Shinro Suzuki, embodying Yami Yuji with spot-on hair and costume, graced the stage. Oh, the Yu-Gi-Oh is here. A-H-H. Shrieks erupted from some girls and women enchanted by Shinro Suzuki's handsome appearance in the Yami Yuji attire. Entering his early twenties, Shinro Suzuki's face had matured, and consistent exercise sculpted his physique, giving him a more manly appearance. This transformation resonated with many women, who now found Shinro more appealing than ever. It's only 11 a.m., and you guys are already turning this place into a frenzy. Shin shook his head, but instead of dampening the excitement, his words only fueled the crowd's enthusiasm, especially as they listened to him speak and observed him up close on the stage. As most of the event participants were avid Kishin fans, some couldn't contain their excitement and shouted, Please marry me. Those standing near the enthusiastic individual fell to chill, realizing the person shouting was a man. Shin, too, experienced a slight chill but brushed it off, only to hear some women shouting, Please marry me. With a wry chuckle, holding the microphone, Shin responded, I'm already married, sorry to disappoint you. It's alright, one of the women shouted loudly, eliciting laughter from the crowd. Shin, unfazed, continued, cough, anyway, let us welcome Bulma briefs. Confusion swept through the crowd as Shinro Suzuki introduced a woman walking onto the stage, a stunning figure adorned in Bulma's costume with turquoise hair. Some men couldn't contain their excitement, letting out roars. Observing the reactions, Shin addressed the audience, let me introduce to you guys, Myra Suzuki, my wife. Upon realizing that Shinro Suzuki was presenting his wife, Myra, to everyone, a hint of annoyance tinged the crowd's reactions. Shin, maintaining a smile, held Myra's hand as she smiled faintly. Boo. This is not real. It should have been me. Many women immediately voiced their disapproval, prompting laughter from Shin and Myra. Witnessing the couple's amusement, even some men grew annoyed. Following this, Shin and Myra introduced the competition games where participants could win awards and rewards. Each competition featured different activities, such as flawlessly portraying characters or showcasing the most beautiful and impressive costumes. Participants' appearances earned additional scores if they suited the character they were cosplaying. The crowd buzzed with excitement, knowing that winners of each competition could claim a reward of 100,000 yen if they secured first place. TV Asahi captured these moments for viewers watching at home. Idori Tanaka, along with Shin's brothers, Shiko and Seiki, tuned into the Casa Pure event program out of curiosity. Observing the diverse characters being cosplayed in the crowd, they found it somewhat weird and intriguing. Observing the participants engage in the competition games where judges would score them, the judging panel consisted of special guests from Kishin, all professionals in the fields of fashion and design. As the competition unfolded, the judges, seasoned veterans in the clothing and fashion industry, experienced a sense of novelty. They found the act of individuals wearing anime or video game character costumes and imitating their hairstyles quite unique. While not an entirely new concept, as the idea of imitating others' clothes, hairstyles, and overall appearance has been present for years, the creativity displayed in this context intrigued them. Chapter 232, Conclusion After completing the side competition games, the Casa Pure event's initial competition began, challenging participants to embody their cosplayed roles shamelessly. Many struggled with embarrassment, but a handful embraced their characters unabashedly. Surprisingly, the ultimate winner was a foreigner portraying Ash Ketchum, alongside his girlfriend cosplaying Pikachu. The Japanese middle-aged man in a Mario costume claimed first place, while Yuji Muto secured the second spot. I can't believe it. The foreigner took the win. Remarked viewers at home, shaking their heads. Japanese. We get embarrassed so easily. Well, what can you expect from a group of video game geeks? 
Some households couldn't resist discussing it, with some feigning confidence in their ability to excel in the competition. However, if placed in the same situation as the Japanese cosplayers, they would likely succumb to embarrassment. They're still not used to it. Observed Shin, watching alongside Myra, who nodded in agreement. It's normal to feel embarrassed. We are Japanese, after all, Myra remarked. Well, they'll soon get accustomed to this. For now, let's see how they perform in the other games, Shin said with a wry chuckle. The foreigner cosplaying Ash Ketchum and his Latina girlfriend, cosplaying Pikachu, received a Casa Pure Masquerade Dramatic Performance Award along with KS1, video games, merchandise, and a 100,000 yen cash prize. Additionally, the first place winners received a monetary reward of 40,000 yen, KS1, and merchandise, while the second place winners earned 20,000 yen and merchandise. Damn, I didn't know there was a KS1 and video games reward besides the 100,000 yen. Well, we better perform well in the next competition. I'm confident I'll win the next competition that doesn't involve acting. I'll be content with 40,000 yen. As if you'll ever win first place. Some people couldn't resist discussing among themselves. Later, the next competition involved participants walking around the stage to showcase their cosplay costumes and strike poses like models. Many joined, thinking it would be easy, just strolling around. However, they were mistaken, as some walked, the crowd, including those cosplaying but not participating, couldn't help but laugh at their walking styles. Ha ha ha, what was that? He walked like a woman. That guy before him also walked like a penguin. Ha ha ha. Even the judges, who were fashion and design experts, couldn't help but shake their heads, while some joined in the laughter with the crowd. When female cosplayers appeared, some men in the audience couldn't help but whistle. The participating women cosplayers showcased a fit physique, embodying characters known for their allure from either anime or video games. Consequently, many young men in the crowd couldn't help but be enthralled. Shin, engrossed and stroking his chin in the room with Myra, received a pinch from her. He turned his head to Myra in confusion. What? Shin asked. Myra pinched him again and, pointing at the television screen, said, Are you so captivated by them? You look like you might devour them at any moment. Shin, taken aback, defended himself, saying, What are you talking about? I'm just watching peacefully here. Myra snorted, remarking, Yeah, peacefully watching females with most of their skin showing, especially close to their private parts, displaying their bodies for all to see. Shin couldn't help but feel helpless as he continued to explain to Myra, who eventually calmed down. The Casa Pure Costume Construction and Stage Presence competition concluded with a woman wearing a sexy Super Metroid costume emerging as the winner. The first place went to the middle-aged man in the Mario costume, who had also secured the first place in the previous event, and the second place was awarded to Zelda. The female winner received the Casa Pure Masquerade Costume Construction Award, along with the same rewards as the first competition event. Afterward, it was finally the final competition games, focusing on the overall performance award evaluating costume, stage presence, and acting performance. Despite some women being attractive with fit figures and others donning well-made costumes, it proved insufficient to clinch victory in the final competition. The same held true for other cosplayers, a good acting performance was also essential. While some cosplayers performed admirably, the ultimate winner was the middle-aged man cosplaying as Mario. Despite being a bit short, portly, and stocky, he exuded an unassuming charm. However, his portrayal of Mario was exceptional his voice mimicked Mario perfectly, and his appearance amused both the on-site crowd and viewers at home. Surprisingly, his ordinary middle-aged appearance, coupled with his shorter stature, didn't hinder his performance. In fact, it enhanced his portrayal of Mario, as Mario shares a similar body type. His costume was also noteworthy, being the latest Mario attire from Kishin merchandise. With that, he secured victory in the competition, earning the coveted Casa Pure Masquerade, overall performance award. Additionally, he received a monetary prize of 100,000 yen and other rewards from Kishin merchandise. And so, the Casa Pure event competitions finally came to an end. Shin and Myra took the stage once more to express a few closing words. Despite the late hour and some attendees having already returned home, the venue remained vibrant with colorful lights. Good night, everyone, thank you for participating in this event. Shin concluded after a series of remarks. Subsequently, he and Myra returned backstage to the room. We'll definitely come again if there's another event like this. It was so much fun. Please take me home, Shinro, shouted some women. Meanwhile, a group of young men who became friends during the event discussed among themselves. I hope I win next time. Me too. Just a first place, and I'll be satisfied. Yeah, same. Look, that guy won two first places and ultimately clinched the victory. A guy pointed at a distance, indicating the middle-aged man cosplaying as Mario, who was surrounded. Yeah, he's a true winner. His friend said with a nod. I hope I win again next time. The middle-aged man as Mario expressed as he found himself surrounded by a small crowd. Chapter 233, Connections. The middle-aged man who cosplayed as Mario was actually going through a challenging phase in life. Without a family and unemployed, he relied on instant noodles to sustain himself and lacked a suitable living space. His ability to participate in the Casa Pure event stemmed from borrowing money from his brother, who is a family man and a salary man. 
Despite his hardships, attending the event turned out to be a positive choice for him. A year ago, when he was employed, he developed a passion for Mario and even practiced mimicking Mario's voice. Little did he expect that this skill would lead him to victory in the competition, earning him around 180,000 yen. He felt it was finally sufficient to afford some non-instant ramen for a change. I hope I win again next time, the middle-aged man couldn't help but say as he was surrounded by a small crowd. Dash. Following the cosplay event's conclusion, Shin recognized that the middle-aged man who cosplayed as Mario would be a suitable candidate to hire. He could act as Mario in various events, including video game competitions, providing entertainment to people. Whether the man would accept the offer depended on his decision. Dash. Takaji Goda, the middle-aged man who cosplayed as Mario, received a surprising letter from Kishin. Realizing he was hired to cosplay as Mario, he promptly went to the Kishin merchandise branch to accept the offer. This was his opportunity, after all. Dash. Meanwhile, after a few days had passed, Shin noted that the round of funding for Kadabra was fortunately secured by Kishin. He managed to secure the necessary funding for Kadabra, totaling $2 million. Given that Jeff was just starting, it wouldn't yield immediate profits. In fact, Jeff informed Oreo Masayoshi, the Kishin representative, that Kadabra Incorporated wouldn't be profitable in its early stages. Although Oreo Masayoshi struggled to comprehend Shinro Suzuki's plan once again, he faithfully followed Shin's instructions. Consequently, $2 million were invested, leaving Oreo Masayoshi feeling uneasy about what seemed like a substantial amount of money wasted. He couldn't fathom why Shinro Suzuki would be willing to spend such a significant sum on an ordinary online bookstore. To be frank, in Oreo Masayoshi's view, Kishin could have established its own online bookstore. Well, Oreo Masayoshi's perspective wasn't entirely off-base. If Shin desired, he could have created his own Amazon. However, he lacked the same level of drive and time commitment as Jeff. Developing the algorithmic data framework of Amazon would be time-consuming, especially given that it relied on customer preferences on the internet. Considering the internet was still in its early stages with only several million users, and Amazon might only attract a hundred or even fewer visitors each day initially, success would take time. Only someone like Jeff, who was also successful in Shin's previous life, could propel Amazon to success. Jeff had the necessary dedication and time to invest. Dash. In late August in the USA, a trailer for the Mortal Kombat film aired on some TV channels. Initially, it didn't garner much attention. However, when people realized it was produced by Kishin Pictures, it caught the interest of many Jurassic Park fans. Given its theme of fighting and martial arts, some anticipated it to be reminiscent of Hong Kong films similar Jackie Chan and Bruce Lee films. The trailer even made its way onto some Disney channels. The other major film studios of the Big Six sensed that Walt Disney was establishing closer ties with Kishin. Why? Primarily because The Lion King had achieved monumental success. Some Disney executives themselves didn't hold much hope for the animated film. On its first day, the box office was only around a few hundred thousand dollars. However, they were surprised when, on the second day, it earned five million dollars. The film continued to gain momentum in box office numbers as word spread. In just a month, The Lion King box office surpassed a hundred million dollars. Even some film studios among the big six were surprised since they knew that Disney hadn't put much effort into marketing The Lion King. Yet, it turned out to be a winner for the year. After about two months of screening, the animated film earned at least two hundred and ninety-six million dollars. While it couldn't quite compare to Jurassic Park, it was a huge success for a film with a budget of 45 million. Because of this, some Disney executives felt that their marketing of The Lion King was a huge success, and Kishin Merchandise, the toy manufacturer of The Lion King, also played a part in this success. Due to this success, the president of Kishin Merchandise in the USA negotiated with Walt Disney for the licensing rights to The Lion King. This allowed them to produce additional characters from the animated film. Recognizing the significant role Kishin merchandise played in the success of The Lion King, Disney sought to establish good relations with Kishin and granted them the license. With the triumph of the Disney animated film, sales of Kishin merchandise's The Lion King soared, benefiting both Kishin and Disney. As the relationship between Kishin and Disney strengthened, Disney also supported Kishin Pictures' second film, Mortal Kombat, serving as its film distributor in the USA. Some film studios, like the previous distributors of Jurassic Park, regretted missing out on Kishin's new film. Simultaneously, they harbored disdain towards Walt Disney for poaching their partners. However, their disappointment was tempered as Jurassic Park continued to generate revenue through tape sales. Now, with Walt Disney's backing in marketing Kishin Pictures' Mortal Kombat, an increasing number of people became aware of the second film from Kishin Pictures. Kishin's connections expanded further through a strong relationship with Walt Disney. Shin recognized Disney's expertise in film management, particularly in animated and hero movies. Disney's extensive network with talented directors and writers was perceived as valuable, especially for potential adaptations of Marvel Comics characters. Chapter 234, Risk The support from Walt Disney for Kishin's new film didn't sit well with the other major film studios, especially Warner Brothers and Universal Studios. They were uneasy about Kishin, a company they were not pleased with, gaining backing from Disney. Little did they know that Disney's higher UPS were merely toying with Kishin's ego. 
The executives at Disney were aware of the ambitious goals of Kishin Pictures' parent company, Kishin Rules. They assumed that Shinro Suzuki, the owner of Kishin, and other leaders within the company were likely proud individuals. As Kishin continued its global growth as a private company, Disney saw the value in establishing connections with Kishin, beyond the success of the Lion King film. Should Walt Disney perceive a potential downfall for Kishin in the future, they could leverage the established connections to their advantage. In September 1994, Warner Brothers experienced success with films like Arizona Dream and Rapa Nui, overshadowing the less-noticed trial by jury. Simultaneously, Universal Studios found modest success with Time Cop and held expectations for the upcoming film The Wild Rider. Amidst their successes, both studios closely monitored the next venture of Kishin Pictures in collaboration with Walt Disney. Despite Kishin Pictures having only one movie, Jurassic Park, it was a massive global success. It wouldn't be surprising if Kishin decides to create sequels for Jurassic Park, as each installment is likely to generate a substantial amount of revenue. However, both the Big Six and Hollywood critics perceived Kishin as somewhat of a perfectionist, meticulously crafting films. Despite being established for about a year, Kishin Pictures had only produced one film, Jurassic Park. This approach garnered disapproval from industry insiders, who believed that a studio of Kishin's magnitude should invest in a more prolific film output. In the film industry, success hinges on luck and audience reception, and the prevailing sentiment was that taking risks with numerous films each year was crucial. The Big Six studios understood the financial gamble inherent in filmmaking, yet they embraced it as a necessary risk to thrive in the industry. Conversely, Kishin's cautious and perfectionist approach was seen as a potential hindrance, risking its standing in the industry if it continued down this path. However, unbeknownst to them, Kishin Pictures, or Shin, was taking a financial risk with the production of Mortal Kombat. Despite the box office success of Mortal Kombat in Shin's previous life with a budget of $20 million, Shin opted to increase the budget for improved CGI, script enhancements, and better performances in the current iteration. Shin understood that merely replicating the previous Mortal Kombat film, including its scripts, cast performances, and relatively tame CGI with reduced violence, would likely yield similar box office results as in his previous life. However, Shin was determined to avoid such a scenario. Shin aimed to enhance the CGI, character scripts, and performances in the Mortal Kombat film, refusing to impose limits on the level of violence. Only by comprehensively elevating the film's overall quality did Shin envision the possibility of a different box office outcome. Despite the increased risk, Shin remained uncertain about the success of this approach. He wasn't sure whether it would match the box office of the previous Mortal Kombat film or potentially surpass it, or if it might even face failure due to Kishin's decision not to tone down the violence. This decision also entailed age restrictions for film screenings, aligning with Shin's ambition to surpass the box office performance of Mortal Kombat in his previous life. Shin didn't mind the possibility of failure, he had sufficient funds to support such an endeavor, and the prospect of taking risks excited him. Initially concerned about how Disney would receive a film with unabated violence like Mortal Kombat, Shin was surprised to find that the 1994 Walt Disney was not as soft as the future Walt Disney from Shin's previous life. In Hollywood, critics were already lambasting the violence and dark themes in the successful 1994 Disney animated film The Lion King, and despite some gruesome scenes that even American audiences found intense, Disney disregarded the criticism. For Disney, as long as profits rolled in, criticism was a normal companion to success. Dash. With Mortal Kombat jointly marketed by Kishin and Disney, Kishin had already produced toys featuring characters from the film. Some video game fans in Japan were already aware of Kishin's KS1 video game, Mortal Kombat, creating an atmosphere of anticipation. In Japan, under the title Mortal Kombat was Shinkan Koren Densetsu. While this alternative name was Eilau recognized locally, the prominence of the Mortal Kombat title meant that foreigners visiting Japan often remembered it more. Kishin's adaptation of a video game into a film piqued the interest of these visitors, prompting them to share the information with friends and family. The concept of a video game being adapted into a film intrigued many, and within a few weeks, news of Kishin's venture became somewhat well-known, especially within the video game community. Even rivals in the video game sector, Tora and Suzuki, became aware of Kishin's endeavor and were curious about the outcome of the film adaptation. Idori Tanaka, having played Mortal Kombat in KS1, observed the opening story intro, noting the violence and impressive special effects. He couldn't shake the feeling that these scenes might be borrowed from Kishin Pictures' upcoming film, Moral Combat. If so, Tanaka thought, Kishin could likely reap profits from the film, given the quality of the scenes in the video game's opening story intro. Meanwhile, the Suzuki group successfully acquired Image Comics for a substantial amount. Soon after, Suzuki Pictures Entertainment announced its intention to bring Image Comics characters to the big screen. This move mirrored a previous strategy employed by Kishin Pictures. The prospect of comics being adapted for the cinema excited fans within the comic book community. Some fans harbored doubts about whether these film studios, especially Japanese companies, could truly meet the expectations of comic fans when it came to adapting comic book material into films. Chapter 235, Potential Collab. PC video games began to be developed by companies with a focus on software and computers. 
The foresight of the computer's gaming future became evident as they immersed themselves in titles like Kishin's Doom. With hundreds of video games already created by various companies for computers, ranging from text-based to the widely embraced attempt at 2.5-dimensional gaming, Microsoft emerged as a key player. While their 2.5-dimensional games, akin to Doom, showcased Microsoft's capabilities, some of their other creations suffered from bugs or glitches, occasionally struggling to run on their own Microsoft operating system. Despite the growing library of computer games, the unmatched popularity of Doom persisted. Even Microsoft's founder, Will Gates, acknowledged in an interview that Doom was a pivotal force in the computer video game industry. Interestingly, Gates expressed a desire for Microsoft to partner with Kishin, but unfortunately, they were already committed to a competitor. At present, Gates found himself invited for an interview and promptly accepted the opportunity without much hesitation. The interviewer posed diverse questions about computer technology and software advancement, exploring their potential impact on the world. When Will Gates was asked about the possibility of partnering with Kishin, he responded, Kishin is presently the major shareholder of Apple, as indicated by this year's shareholder lists report. So, I'm afraid it's not feasible. The interviewer chuckled lightly in response. In fact, as per the Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, Kishin currently holds a significant stake in Apple, making it nearly implausible for them to form a partnership with a competitor of their supported company. After the interview concluded, Will Gates strolled out of the building and stepped into his luxurious black car when his phone suddenly rang. Hello. Will Gates answered, placing the phone to his ear. Is this Mr. Gates? inquired a deep yet rugged voice. Yes, Will Gates affirmed, adding, who might you be? Confusion clouded his thoughts, especially considering he didn't recognize the caller. The distinctive tone hinted at a Japanese origin. While Gates had encountered a few Japanese businessmen in the USA and shared his number, he doubted they would open with a direct is this Mr. Gates. I am Oreo Masayoshi, resonated the deep voice on the phone. Upon hearing the name, Will Gates furrowed his brows and remarked, Oreo, Masayoshi. I don't recall meeting anyone with that name. He was certain that such a distinctive name would stick in his memory, especially with the Oreo resembling the well-known Biscuits Company. The man chuckled audibly, and Will Gates detected it faintly before Oreo Masayoshi spoke again, saying, I apologize for interrupting your business, Mr. Gates, but I reached out to you for a business matter. Will Gates frowned, as typically, Oreo Masayoshi should have contacted the corporate development team instead of reaching out directly to him. Well, if it's business-related, our corporate team can handle the discussions, Will Gates remarked, his tone not too harsh or cold. He recognized that the Japanese man's ability to contact him directly suggested a level of influence or connections. In matters unrelated to business, he preferred not to offend anyone, regardless of their status. If that's the case, well, the corporate team would have been a suitable choice, but approaching you directly seemed like the better option, replied Oreo Masayoshi. Why is that? Will Gates grew more intrigued, glancing out of the car window as it sped along the road. Well, I'm sure you'll be interested in Kishin, Oreo Masayoshi said with a smile. He added, I'm from Kishin, and I called Mr. Gates to inquire whether you are interested in video game development. Will Gates was taken aback, responding, you're from Kishin. Upon Oreo Masayoshi's confirmation, he couldn't help but inquire, regarding video game development. Can you provide me with the details? At this moment, a hint of excitement colored his words. Will Gates and Oreo Masayoshi delved into a lengthy phone discussion, during which Will Gates was astonished to learn that there was a possibility of cooperation between Kishin and Microsoft. This revelation caught him by surprise, considering he had already resigned to the notion that Kishin's video games might not be available on their operating systems. The video game development discussed between Will Gates and Oreo Masayoshi centered around the Kishin Unreal Engine project. Kishin proposed a deal to collaborate with Microsoft in developing the Unreal Engine. However, the program would remain under Kishin's ownership, with Microsoft providing assistance. Through this partnership, Kishin aimed to make their current and future PC video games accessible on Microsoft's operating system. Moreover, Microsoft would gain the advantage of using the Unreal Engine under a more favorable licensing agreement, offering lower royalties compared to other options. In essence, it constituted a licensing agreement benefiting both parties. Our Unreal Engine is still in the beta stage, not yet fully finished, but it's already advanced in video game development. Microsoft will provide some assistance in this collaboration to further develop the Unreal Engine, Oreo Masayoshi explained. While Kishin is open to collaborating with Microsoft on the Unreal Engine development, they propose a licensing agreement that safeguards Kishin's intellectual property, as well as the Unreal Engine source code and data. Breaking such a contract would not be in Microsoft's best interest, considering the Unreal Engine includes proprietary code protected by copyright and other intellectual property laws. Additionally, the presence of obfuscated code makes it challenging for other companies to comprehend, rendering any potential leak essentially useless unless Kishin provides assistance. The licensing agreement extends Microsoft the privilege to use the Unreal Engine for its products and services. Although Will Gates isn't particularly keen on video game development alone, he finds himself genuinely excited and intrigued by Kishin's proposal. Chapter 236, Premiere
In Japan, around October, Kishin Pictures showcased the Mortal Kombat trailer in Tokyo, surprising numerous video game enthusiasts. While the term Motoru Kombato was familiar to the Japanese, the game was known as Shinkan Kurin Densetsu outside Tokyo. However, Motoru Kombato gained more prominence in Tokyo. Thus, when fans witnessed the Mortal Kombat trailer on television, excitement ensued among video game enthusiasts. The game had become a favorite alongside Street Fighter, gradually surpassing its popularity in Japan. The allure of Mortal Kombat lay in its exhilarating gameplay, featuring graphic violence. Despite its unrestricted access for those aged 7 and above, the pixelated and cartoon-like portrayal of blood and gore, coupled with less disturbing sound effects, contributed to its wide acceptance. During this time, the Japanese imposed minimal restrictions on anime or video games, unless they involved gambling or had a detrimental impact on children. As Mortal Kombat was perceived as an unrealistic fighting game akin to Street Fighter, it didn't raise much concern among the populace. During this period, Japan grappled with an ongoing economic recession, prompting the government to tread lightly on the video game industry, recognizing its modest contribution to economic recovery. In a particular household, a young man reclining on the sofa, fixated on the television, couldn't help but remark, I never expected Kishin to consider adapting their video game into a film. Not particularly a video game enthusiast, he preferred staying home to indulge in occasional anime TV shows or films. The anime landscape had evolved, with Kishin animes no longer standing as the sole option. While Kishin boasted the most popular and captivating anime, other studios had begun to innovate, drawing many newcomers into the anime industry. Tora and Suzuki were genuinely grateful to Kishin for inspiring their entry into the anime industry, driven by the success of Pokemon. Their timing was opportune, as they joined the industry in its early stages, now witnessing its evolution into a highly profitable sector. In the current scenario, the Japanese video game community buzzed with anticipation following the release of the Mortal Kombat trailer. The film is set to premiere in the USA, followed by a nationwide screening for two weeks before reaching audiences in Japan. Video game enthusiasts, in particular, were keen to see how the adaptation from a video game would unfold on the big screen. Many who weren't avid video game fans assumed that it would turn out poorly, as adaptations from inherently unrealistic series often end up as disappointments. On October 12, 1994, in the USA, the film Mortal Kombat had its first premiere in New York. The theater buzzed with activity as the media and the crowd warmly welcomed the cast of Mortal Kombat, who were then interviewed by reporters. Subsequently, they entered the cinema and took their seats. Among the audience, several film critics were present, eagerly awaiting the latest offering from Kishin Pictures. It would be dishonest to say they had no expectations, in reality, they were anticipating Kishin to deliver a quality film, especially after the success of Jurassic Park they hoped Kishin would surpass their expectations. Some were aware that Mortal Kombat was a video game adaptation from Japan, leading them to temper their expectations. They understood that adaptations, be it from novels or comics, could fall short if they diverged from the expectations of fans of the original source material. The realm of film adaptations, especially those based on video games, is largely uncharted. Consequently, some film critics, aware of the movie's video game origins, harbored low expectations and even anticipated it to be subpar. As they contemplated, the cinema screen brightened, unveiling the Kishin intro. This time, the intro was rendered in 3D animation, a notable improvement from previous versions. The animation portrayed a boy holding an umbrella on a dark, rainy grassland night. The wind whisked away the umbrella into the sky, where stars and clouds converged to form the word Kishin. The umbrella then floated between the K and S, ultimately shaping the word Kishin, accompanied by a picture drifting beside the logo. Many recognized it as the distinctive mark of Kishin Pictures. The audience was thoroughly impressed the animation surpassed the intro of Kishin in the film Jurassic Park. Following that, the Walt Disney introduction followed suit, also animated but incomparable to Kishin's breathtaking 3D animation. Certain audience members, including film critics and computer experts, sensed that Kishin's strides in graphics development outpaced others. Little did they know that the animations were primarily crafted by Pixar, in collaboration with Kishin's CGI company and motion capture company. Following the introduction of the production and distribution details, Mortal Kombat finally commenced. It opened with a fiercely realistic display of fire, accompanied by the resounding strikes of a hammer against metal, and the iconic music theme from the Mortal Kombat video game. Though the music's 16-bit resemblance was noted by the audience, their attention shifted as the hammer's clang grew more pronounced. The metal dragon emblem of Mortal Kombat emerged from the fiery furnace before settling onto stone. A hand holding a hammer descended upon it, and the camera captured the emblem being returned to the blazing furnace. Inside, the dragon emblem, Mortal Kombat logo, was engulfed in flames, creating a remarkably realistic scene. As the music theme subsided, the screen gradually darkened, transitioning to a temple-laden environment shrouded in dark clouds. On the stage arena, two figures stood a young man and a towering, menacing counterpart. The audience felt the tension rise with the accompaniment of intense music. The menacing figure lunged at the determined young man, landing a punch that was skillfully evaded. A series of counterattacks ensued, with the young man delivering a kick that the menacing opponent narrowly dodged. 
After a sequence of intense fighting moves, the menacing man seized the young man's arms, causing him to scream in pain as the antagonist twisted them for all to witness. Some in the audience couldn't bear to watch, covering, or closing their eyes. Attempting to escape, the young man dashed towards the stage arena's edge, only to be met with the menacing man's laughter as a bolt of lightning coincidentally struck the area he was headed. The menacing man cruelly laughed as he caught up to the young man, gripping his throat. Against all odds, the young man hoisted his assailant into the air, blood spewing from his mouth. Eventually, the young man succumbed, gasping for breath. The menacing figure stared directly at the audience, his emotionless voice echoing, Your brother's soul is mine. You will be next. The audience, unprepared for such violence at the film's outset, found themselves shocked by the intense and brutal scenes unfolding before them. Chapter 237, Summary After the menacing man uttered the chilling words, You will be next, his face morphed into a monstrous visage, sending a shiver through the audience. The unsettling moment lingered briefly before transitioning to a scene featuring an Asian man sitting on a bed, his expression reflecting shock. As the scene unfolded, the audience grasped that the initial sequence was nothing more than a dream. Nevertheless, it commenced with a powerful yet strikingly violent scene. The man with sharply defined yet thick eyebrows left a lasting impression on viewers. Many had encountered such a character in Hong Kong films, where individuals of similar appearance often played menacing roles. Film critics acknowledged the effectiveness of these antagonist archetypes in martial arts Asian movies, although they acknowledged that such portrayals could sometimes verge on cliché. As the film unfolded, a character emerged, reminiscent of Terminator, as one of the guy's eyes appeared cybernetic. Subsequently, Sonya Blade, armed with guns, engaged in a firefight. The echoing gunshots scattered the bustling crowd as she adeptly took down a man aiming at her. Approaching the fallen adversary, she swiftly searched his body for a wallet, a phone, and more. However, none of the man's belongings provided the lead Sonya Blade needed in her investigation. Based on the dialogue preceding the scene, the audience inferred that the skilled woman was likely searching for the Terminator-like character, Kano. Continuing the story, the antagonist, named Shing Tsung, assumed a deceptive guise as an elderly American man to entice Hollywood star Johnny Cage into a tournament. The transformation effect of Shing Tsung appeared remarkably realistic, thanks to the meticulous and advanced CGI and 3D animations by Qishin. Meanwhile, the main character, Liu, entered a temple in China. With mysterious origins, he possessed white hair, blue eyes that flickered like lightning, and wore a bamboo hat. Liu engaged in conversation with an old monk. As the narrative unfolded, it revealed a tournament taking place in the outer world. The man in the temple, concealed by a bamboo hat, with white hair and magical eyes, turned out to be a god of thunder and the protector of the earth realm. As the audience immersed themselves in the narrative, they were particularly impressed by the film's special effects and CGI. The storyline revolving around a tournament in the outer world captured their interest. The fight scenes were both intense and brutal, featuring moments like a mob member being kicked in a particularly sensitive area. The cast's combat against the antagonist forces stood out for its uniqueness, resembling a Jackie Chan movie. The choreography avoided stiffness, maintaining a natural and well-paced flow. Movements in the fight scenes were not only smooth but also carried a sense of brutality. Unbeknownst to many, Kishin had actually invited Jackie Chan for suggestions on the fight scenes. While Chen didn't direct the film, his valuable ideas and input significantly enhanced the creativity in the Mortal Kombat fight sequences. The plot of the film Mortal Kombat unfolded to be much more intricate and captivating than audiences initially anticipated. The seemingly invincible antagonist turned out to be a subordinate of the Outer World Emperor, and Sheng Tsung, once perceived as the ultimate threat, was revealed to be a sorcerer. Sheng Tsung manipulated the forces of the Outer World to confront Liu, Johnny Cage, and Sonya Blade, aided by the God of Thunder, Lord Raiden. In a specific scene where Outer World mobs attempted to overwhelm Liu Kong, Johnny Cage, and Sonya Blade, the God of Thunder, Lord Raiden, seated serenely on a rock, warned the hundreds of Outer World mobs with lightning sparking on his fingers and eyes. The lightning special effects, enhanced by advanced CGI and animations by Qishin, appeared simultaneously cool and menacing. As Lord Raiden challenged the mobs, he said, you give it a try. Subsequent scenes featured the characters battling Outer World creatures, including a four-armed opponent. One particularly impressive moment for the audience was when Shing Tsung absorbed the life energy and soul of a person, declaring fatality with an echoing effect that left a lasting impression. The soundtrack had a distinct video game vibe, even for those unfamiliar with the Mortal Kombat video games. Many felt that Kishin might be considering adapting the film into a video game, given the unmistakable quality of the soundtrack. Dash. As the Mortal Kombat film premiered in New York, the collaboration between Kishin and Microsoft was officially sealed. Will Gates himself was genuinely pleased with the collaboration, as Kishin expressed willingness to make their PC video games available on the Microsoft operating system. Furthermore, he eagerly anticipated Kishin's upcoming video game that promised to redefine the landscape of PC gaming. The game was set to be released on both Apple computers and Microsoft OS, bearing the title Warcraft, Orcs and Humans. Will Gates found his excitement justified after playing the game and discovering its real-time strategy, RTS, nature. Impressed by the gameplay, he and his friends were convinced that Warcraft, Orcs and Humans had the potential to revolutionize computer video games, akin to the impact of the game Doom. 
Simultaneously thrilled and curious, Will Gates and his friends harbored a desire to meet Shinro Suzuki, as Oreo Masayoshi had asserted that Suzuki was the visionary behind these innovative ideas. Anticipating the release of the new Kishin PC video game, they foresaw another pleasant surprise for the burgeoning community of PC gamers. Although the PC gaming community was smaller than its console counterpart, industry experts believed in the greater potential of computer gamers. Unlike consoles, PCs could seamlessly handle 2.5D, offering a technological advantage. Even with Kishin's latest video game console, the KS1, struggles persisted in smoothly handling 2.5D, remaining confined to a 2D environment with rendered backgrounds and objects. Chapter 238, Confusion After playing the Warcraft, Orcs and Humans video game, Steve Jobs found it genuinely interesting, stating, Kishin is truly deserving of being a top video game company. Envisioning a boost in Apple's stocks and sales with another captivating PC game, Jobs was optimistic. However, his optimism faded when he learned that Kishin would collaborate with Microsoft, making games like Star Control, Terminal Velocity, Stone Keep, and the renowned Doom available on Microsoft platforms. Surprisingly, even the anticipated Warcraft, Orcs and Humans would be accessible on Microsoft operating systems. Steve Jobs, upon hearing this, couldn't help but frown and feel confused. Why would Kishin, a major stakeholder in Apple, support their direct competitor? Deep in thought, Steve Jobs pondered the situation and ultimately dialed Shinro Suzuki's number. As the phone rang, he found himself nervously tapping his office desk. After what felt like an eternity, the call connected, and Shinro Suzuki's voice came through, saying, Veg I mean, Jobs, what's up? Dash. Meanwhile, in his office immersed in a game of Doom 2, Shin almost dubbed Steve Jobs Veggie Man but thankfully caught himself in time. After all, Jobs had been a legendary innovator in his past life. Wondering why Steve Jobs had chosen to call him, Shin heard Jobs' voice saying, Suzuki, I just learned that Kishin has collaborated with Microsoft. Upon hearing this, Shin smiled, faintly expecting Jobs to reach out. He replied, oh, so you heard about it. Dash. In the CEO office at Apple headquarters, upon personally confirming Shinro Suzuki's words, Steve Jobs couldn't help but exclaim, I never thought that you would collaborate with Microsoft. Pausing, he added, and here I was, envisioning Apple monopolizing PC video games with Kishin's support. Haha, <laughs> video games should be available on every platform to truly realize their potential, Shin's voice resonated on the phone. I understand, but considering Kishin's major stakes in our company, Apple, why collaborate with Apple's competitor? Steve Jobs inquired. While he didn't strongly disapprove of Kishin's decision, recognizing it as a business move, confusion lingered. After all, with Kishin as a major Apple shareholder, collaborating with Microsoft could impact Apple's sales, indirectly affecting Kishin. Dash. Shin chuckled at Steve Jobs' question and replied, Well, Microsoft excels in software development, and Kishin has decided to collaborate for the development of our crucial Kishin software and essential game engine, to be precise. Upon hearing this, Steve Jobs couldn't help but say, Is it the VG engine development? I thought Kishin and Apple were already working on that software. Dash. Growing more confused, Steve Jobs processed Shinro Suzuki's words. Kishin and Microsoft were apparently collaborating on a game engine software. However, Jobs was perplexed since Kishin and Apple were already partners in developing the VG engine. While details of the collaboration weren't disclosed, Jobs deduced that, based on Suzuki's words, the only advanced game development software was the VG engine. What other game engine software could they be developing? Dash. Shin realized Steve Jobs had misunderstood the game engine software situation, as Jobs wasn't aware of Kishin's Unreal Engine game engine project beyond the VG engine. So, Shin immediately clarified, saying, No, it's not the VG engine game engine software you're thinking of. He paused before adding, it's another ongoing project of Kishin, the Unreal Engine. In fact, Unreal Engine started before VG Engine, and much of the source code and functions of VG Engine were inspired by our ongoing project, Unreal Engine. Dash. Upon hearing Shinro Suzuki's explanation, Steve Jobs was slightly surprised. I didn't know that. So, it was another game engine software, and this one came before VG Engine. Then Shinro Suzuki's voice chimed in, that's right. And before Unreal Engine, there was the Doom Engine. You could say it's the evolution of Kishin's game engine software development, hee <laughs> hee. Steve Jobs finally grasped the situation. I see. So Kishin collaborated with Microsoft for the development of Unreal Engine. He paused before adding, I'm not in a position to question why you chose Microsoft over Apple for this software's development, but I assume you have your reasons. Dash. Shin smiled upon hearing this and replied, didn't I tell you? Pausing, he added, it's about our video games not being limited to a specific platform. Besides enhancing our Unreal Engine project, it's also an opportunity to make our video games available on Microsoft. Shin then heard Steve Jobs saying, I see. I may not understand the difference between the VG Engine and the so-called Unreal Engine, but I suppose you have a point in making Kishin video games available beyond Apple platforms. Despite being a major shareholder in our company, Apple, Kishin remains true to its purpose as a video game company. I'm aware that Kishin PC video game sales would be significantly limited if restricted to Apple alone. Shin heard Steve Jobs chuckle, and he smiled faintly. 
He knew Jobs would understand, and he wasn't mistaken about that. Dash. Meanwhile, after the film Mortal Kombat concluded, the audience applauded for a few minutes. The cast of Mortal Kombat smiled with emotion as they witnessed the crowd's enthusiastic response. The audience was genuinely impressed by the film, particularly the final fight scene between Liu Kong and Shang Tsung. It appeared that Kishin had invested considerable effort and money into producing the CGI special effects for the fight scene, and the martial arts combat of both actors was splendid as well. Chapter 239, Good Results The Mortal Kombat surpasses audience expectations, excelling in CGI, special effects, and the martial arts performances of the cast. The dialogue is generally satisfactory, though there are moments, like the antagonist's use of the fatality term, that might be less relatable. Overall, the film is both menacing and cool. However, its excessive violence and cruelty, highlighted by bone-cracking scenes and prominent gore, make Mortal Kombat suitable primarily for a mature audience. Some film critics express mixed feelings, with some finding it very good, while others are unimpressed due to the film's intense focus on gore and violence. While opinions among the general audience may vary, many found Mortal Kombat to be very good overall. I felt my blood rushing in excitement as they battled the outer world forces, one person shared with their friend. I liked Lord Raiden, he's such a cool character, another friend chimed in. Yeah, I liked him too, agreed another. I wonder if Mortal Kombat will get a sequel. I'm genuinely interested in the outer world. Me too. The audience engaged in discussions, and the consensus was that most of them enjoyed the film. As the audience gradually exited the cinema, some were approached by various media outlets for interviews. What are your thoughts on the Mortal Kombat film? inquired a Fox reporter, addressing a man leaving the theater. It was a really good film, I must say, the Caucasian man exclaimed. He then added, but make sure not to bring your child, all right? The movie isn't exactly family friendly. The Fox reporter nodded and asked, I see. Does it include intense scenes as expected? The man nodded and replied, that's right. Even though I'm accustomed to gore and violence in films, typically horror movies, I can confidently say that Mortal Kombat definitely ranks high in terms of gore and violence, especially in the fight scenes. Other interviewed audience members echoed similar sentiments. Dash. Following the premiere, those fortunate enough to attend Mortal Kombat began spreading the word to friends and family, generating some buzz. As days passed, the film saw a widespread release in cinemas, attracting a considerable audience. People eagerly purchased tickets, and during the screenings, viewers were notably impressed by the initial part of the film. Post-viewing, discussions about the movie naturally ensued among friends. Soon after the first day box office results were released, Mortal Kombat had raked in around $2 million. The box office results brought a sigh of relief to Shin, who had been closely monitoring the first day performance of Mortal Kombat. Witnessing its strong initial showing, Shin felt a sense of relief. After all, he had made significant changes to the overall film, departing from the one in his previous life that only promised minimal success. However, Shin acknowledged that there were still more days and months ahead, and whether Mortal Kombat would maintain its success at the box office remained uncertain. Despite this, Shin remained hopeful. Dash. A week after the widespread screening of Mortal Kombat, the box office results surprised everyone, reaching around $48 million. It proved to be a massive success, with Mortal Kombat gaining widespread popularity in the USA through Kishin's merchandise, featuring Mortal Kombat toys and action figures, and benefiting from additional marketing by Walt Disney. The marketing strategies proved highly effective, propelling Mortal Kombat to surpass even the successful films of Warner Brothers and Universal Studios. Newspapers in New York featured headlines such as another film with box office success from Kishin Pictures. After one of the most successful box office films, Jurassic Park, Kishin strikes again with their new film, Mortal Kombat? The film is lauded for its advanced CGI, animation, special effects, sound effects, and soundtrack. However, it also faces criticism for its gore and violence, reads the newspaper below the headline. Many readers, discovering this news through newspapers, became aware of the emerging film in Hollywood. Some remarked, oh, the film studio that produced Jurassic Park I guess there's no harm in watching it. Most of the older generation, who still read newspapers, share somewhat similar opinions. Dash. Simultaneously, numerous video game enthusiasts in the USA who watched Mortal Kombat discovered that there's actually a video game in Japan with the same name as the film. This revelation came through the widespread attention given by film critics in their reviews of the Mortal Kombat film. Some film critics noted that the movie was adapted from a video game gaining modest popularity in Japan. While a few critics rated Mortal Kombat as low as 3 stars out of 5, the majority awarded it full stars. Simultaneously, the curiosity of video game fans was piqued, with some considering a trip to Japan to obtain the game. However, the anticipation grew further when Kishin announced the upcoming release of their KS-1 in the USA market though the exact date remained uncertain. Later, news spread of a collaboration between Kishin and Microsoft, revealing that Kishin PC video games would soon be available on Microsoft operating systems. This development excited computer enthusiasts who were also video game fans. It brought a sense of satisfaction among computer enthusiasts, and some of them expressed their excitement. Great, I'll finally be able to play Doom on our PC, exclaimed a young man to his friend in class. 
I was about to sell my HP computer, but it seems that there's no need to. His friend nodded in agreement. My Toshiba computer will finally have some use. Another added. I'll finally be able to run Kishin PC video games on my computer. Chapter 240, Warcraft. The collaboration between Kishin and Microsoft caught the attention of several companies. Initially, many considered the idea of Kishin partnering with Microsoft impossible. However, the current reality surpasses their expectations. Kishin and Microsoft? I thought it was Kishin and Apple. Remarked the CEO of Anemos, an emerging video game entertainment company focused on Microsoft operating system. While their games are generally average, a few stand out, ranging from puzzles to side-scrolling and 2.5D attempts. While Anemos video games may not compare to Kishin's, Microsoft users have had no choice but to purchase most of their titles, given Kishin's exclusivity to Apple. Now that Kishin is available on Microsoft operating systems, the CEO and executives of Anemos are growing concerned. The introduction of Kishin PC games is likely to impact their sales. I thought I could just play video games without worrying about our mediocre titles not selling, sighed the CEO. To be honest, most of the games they've released so far are derivatives of console games, whether from independent companies or giants like Kishin, Tora, and Suzuki, the successes in the console gaming industry. Now, with Kishin on the horizon, it appears imperative for them to enhance and innovate their video games, otherwise, Kishin might snatch away all their customers. Dash. As the collaboration between Kishin and Microsoft became public, and the development of the Unreal Engine video game engine software project commenced alongside Microsoft, Shin perused the Microsoft video game library. He sensed that the world of video game development still had a long way to go. One particular video game entertainment company caught Shin's eye. Despite seemingly emulating console games, they injected originality that made their games more interesting. Recognizing their creativity, Shin observed that Anemos started strong with good games at their founding but gradually began releasing inferior titles, some outright copies of console games. The company must have become too complacent, risking a decline once we enter the scene, Shin muttered as he scrolled through games on his Microsoft computer. Not only that company, but it seems several video game entertainment companies shared a similar fate. They grew overly confident in monopolizing the Microsoft operating system for video games. What Shin wasn't aware of was the fact that the game developers at these companies were producing games lazily, indulging in hours of playing Kishin PC games. If Shin had known, he would surely recall his previous life's company, where game developers played games for hours and passed responsibilities on to weaker employees, including female colleagues, and the same held true for the weak math algebra, Shin's previous name. Shin vividly remembered how a female employee was harassed by their higher UPS. Although such occurrences were deemed normal in the day-to-day -day work at that company, Math Algebra was unfortunate to witness a horrific scene involving the CEO and his daughter-in-law, who also worked in the company. While affairs were common, it was Math's bad luck to witness his boss's family affair. Now, as Shin develops video games for PC based on his previous life's company, memories flood back, reminding him of the days at the company. Initially joining as a fan of their games, it turned out to be a hellhole a past he preferred not to revisit. That's why Shin consistently emphasizes in his current company the importance of responsibility, discouraging the passing of tasks to others. He makes it clear that failing to uphold this principle means bidding farewell to his company. Dash. After a week of widescreening success in the USA, Mortal Kombat now began its screening in Tokyo, Japan, marking another milestone for the film. The enthusiastic Mortal Kombat fans were not only excited but went as far as donning character costumes from the game as they headed to the cinemas. It's evident that, even without extensive marketing, the film Mortal Kombat is poised to receive substantial support from the Japanese audience. Given the game's existing popularity in the country, the film's attention comes as no surprise. Meanwhile, companies like Tora, Suzuki, and others with stakes in the film industry couldn't help but consider producing a martial arts movie after watching Mortal Kombat. The potential profitability is tempting. However, they acknowledge they are not Kishin and, cautiously, it remains just a thought, as they won't risk the same financial commitment as Kishin. Meanwhile, Seizama and Kumiko also watched Mortal Kombat and couldn't help but feel a sense of disappointment as they hadn't seen a samurai in the film thus far. It seems that Brad hasn't yet experienced the glory of a samurai, Seizama muttered as he watched from his home studio. In a departure from the past, Kishin had specifically provided Seizama Suzuki with a copy of the film for him to watch at home. I'm sure he knows, my dear. After all, there's Zoro in One Piece. Kumiko chuckled softly as she spoke. Wait, you're reading One Piece. Seizama couldn't help but exclaim. While you're busy with your video games, I indulge in manga series from time to time. Kumiko chuckled softly in response. My favorite is Zoro. Seizama continued, bombarding Kumiko with words, only to stop abruptly when he realized they were still in the middle of watching Mortal Kombat. Dash. After about a month of collaboration between Kishin and Microsoft, Kishin's video games gradually made their way to the Microsoft operating system. Soon, the sales of Kishin PC video games surged. Despite the collaboration causing a slight decline in Apple's sales, it was still acceptable. Furthermore, Kishin released a new PC video game called Warcraft, Orcs and Humans. Chapter 241, Community. 
After the Kishin PC video games made their debut in the USA and became accessible on Microsoft operating systems, numerous computer enthusiasts flocked to Kishin stores to purchase these sought-after titles. Upon entering the Kishin store with his friends, Michael noticed a conspicuous board featuring an image and apparent advertisement for a video game. The image depicted a green monster's face confronting a human face, both locked in a gaze with evident fighting intent. Above the image, a title boldly proclaimed, Warcraft, Orcs and Humans. Below, the logos of Kishin, Microsoft, and Apple were displayed. Look, it seems to be a PC video game, Ronald pointed at the image. Michael nodded, and they examined the advertisement board more closely with their friends. Oh, it appears to revolve around orcs versus humans just from this image alone, Michael remarked, nodding. He then turned to his friends and declared, I'll purchase this game. Since this advertisement is prominently placed at the front of the Kishin store, the game must be noteworthy compared to other PC games. You're right. Yeah, I suppose it's worth a try. Later, they entered the store and purchased several PC video games, including Warcraft, Orcs and Humans from the PC video games section. After chatting with his friends for a while, Michael headed home. Once in his room, he eagerly installed the recently acquired game, intrigued by the advertisement he had seen in front of the Kishin store. Upon successful installation, Michael delved into the game story manual before launching it. The game's soundtrack filled the room as he initiated the game, and a narrated introduction unfolded the tale. With the soon-to-be iconic Welcome to the World of Warcraft, the video game's title appeared, accompanied by various options. Michael opted for a new game, selecting single-player and the human campaign. Once again, the narrator conveyed the story from the player's perspective, providing insights into the conflicts between humans and orcs. Michael, genuinely curious about the gameplay, found little information in the story manual beyond the narrative of human and orc conflicts. After the men narrated the story of the player becoming a regent of the parcel of land, the game commenced, and Michael observed that the video game perspective provided a sweeping view of the entire land and its characters. Gradually, he realized that the gameplay operated through the cursor, and tapping on the game characters triggered a response, yes, my lord. Upon repeatedly tapping the same character, it displayed signs of irritation, exclaiming, why do you keep touching me? This prompted a chuckle from Michael, and he shook his head before grasping the intricacies of the game. Slowly, he discovered the necessity of accumulating resources like wood and constructing more establishments in the area. Eventually, he successfully completed the game with a record result. The gameplay is quite different from what I anticipated, Michael mused as he gradually unraveled its mechanics. From his perspective, the gameplay involved building structures, collecting resources, and managing the landscape. Though Michael hadn't fully comprehended the game yet, he found it intriguing. In the second game, he found himself tasked with protecting a town, and his human characters encountered enemies, engaging in battles with them. Consequently, he became increasingly immersed in the gameplay, and the process of figuring things out while playing entertained Michael for quite a while. Dash. A few days after the release of Warcraft, Orcs and Humans, video game enthusiasts were still in the process of figuring things out. Gradually, a community of Warcraft enthusiasts started to emerge online. During this period, Kishin had a website with a dedicated community section. Despite its simple design and layout, the website proved suitable for communication through chat. The community section housed a discussion forum on the Kishin website featuring a list of Kishin video games. Fans of a particular game could select from the list and join their respective communities. Although internet usage was not yet widespread, especially among computer users, there were already many individuals actively utilizing the internet. Upon visiting the Kishin website, fans of the game Warcraft swiftly registered, leading to the gradual growth of the Warcraft community. During this period, the majority of video game communities on the Kishin website consisted mainly of Japanese discussions, with texts in Japanese that Americans couldn't comprehend. However, more Americans began using the Kishin website, primarily driven by their interest in Warcraft, a PC video game. Despite the existing fanbase for Kishin in the USA, the majority of video game enthusiasts were console users rather than PC users. Consequently, many were unaware of the community on the Kishin website. However, thanks to the PC video game Warcraft, a direct link to the Kishin website was suggested within the game itself, leading users directly to the Warcraft community in the Kishin forum. Soon, hundreds of users became active participants, engaging in discussions about Warcraft, Orcs and Humans gameplay and game mechanics. Their primary focus, however, was on the game's strategies, as new players quickly recognized their significance. The community also delved into the game's lore and story, recognizing their potential importance in the overall gaming experience. This highlighted the gradual rise of the PC game Warcraft's popularity on the internet. Remarkably, within just a few days in the market, Warcraft not only garnered a substantial following but also contributed, albeit modestly, to the growth of internet users by the hundreds. Dash. Meanwhile, most console gamers held little opinion about Kishin's PC games. Their interest lay not in PC games but in KS1 and its video games. Up to this point, they continued to immerse themselves in 16-bit gaming experiences, enjoying the extensive library of Kishin's 16-bit games. Despite the satisfaction derived from these games, their anticipation focused on the awaited release of the new Kishin console, the KS1, along with its accompanying video games. 
As the weeks passed without any updates, some gamers grew anxious about whether Kishin would indeed release the KS1 this year. However, their concerns soon transformed into excitement when Kishin officially announced the imminent release of the KS1 in the USA. Chapter 242, Ridiculous Theory In November 1994, Joanne Kathleen submitted her manuscript to Rookie Bookstore. Prior to Rookie Bookstore's establishment in the UK, her manuscript had been rejected by several other publishers. This time, Joanne felt a sense of worry as she approached Rookie Bookstore, uncertain about whether they would accept her work. Upon entering the bookstore, Joanne faced the female manager, who appeared to be Asian, possibly Japanese due to her accent. The manager meticulously scrutinized Joanne's manuscripts. Wow, this is truly interesting, the Japanese woman exclaimed. From these scripts alone, I can tell that it's wonderful. Really. Joanne was pleasantly surprised by the manager's reaction, feeling relieved that her work had been well received. However, unbeknownst to Joanne, the Japanese woman had received instructions from the higher UPS not to reject any books related to magic unless they were exceptionally poor. The Japanese woman found herself perplexed about the situation, not fully understanding the reasons behind it. However, it was Shin who had orchestrated these instructions. This directive wasn't exclusive to her, managers in the UK had also received identical instructions. Shin had specifically established several bookstores in the UK with the hope of discovering the author of the renowned work from his previous life, Harry Potter. Despite the financial risks and the decline in sales for his publishing company due to the policy of not rejecting any books related to magic and fantasy unless they were exceptionally poor, Shin believed it was worthwhile. Most of these books sold modestly, but with Shin's current financial strength, he felt confident in managing the situation. The Japanese woman, engrossed in reading the Harry Potter manuscript, found the story captivating and willingly accepted it. During the discussion of the contract and royalties, Joanne was pleased with Rookie Bookstore, as they offered more favorable terms compared to other publishers. Despite her disapproval of the terms offered by other book publishers, the majority rejected her manuscript. Dash. On November 12, 1994, KS1 and video games made their debut in the USA market. Excited console gamers flocked to Kishin stores and other distributors in malls. Console gamers gradually purchased KS1 and video games, including popular titles like Resident Evil, Kishin All-Stars Racing, and Mortal Kombat. Within a few days, these games resonated in the console gaming communities. Particularly, Resident Evil, 1 Rupee, sparked discussions among gamers, prompting them to delve deeper into the game's story and gameplay. The CD cover directed them to the Kishin website's discussion forum for Resident Evil. Upon visiting the website, they found a plethora of discussions in the Resident Evil community, primarily in Japanese. When Americans selected their country as the USA, the discussions switched to English. Although the English discussions were still limited compared to the Japanese ones, Americans were beginning to explore the website and its communities. Dash. Andrea, a young woman who had just played Resident Evil, sat in front of her family computer. She registered on the Kishin website and searched for the Resident Evil community in the forum. Upon reaching the Resident Evil community, she noticed a few discussions had already been posted. She chose the most popular post with dozens of likes, authored by a user named I am Johnny Cage. The post's title intrigued her, what if Resident Evil was an inspiration for real life? Inspiration for real life? What's this supposed to mean? Andrea couldn't help but wonder. Having recently played the Resident Evil game, the image of the zombie turning its head lingered in her memory. As Andrea read the post, she realized it was a theory suggesting that Resident Evil mirrored real-world events. In just a few days of the Resident Evil game's presence in the USA, there was already a theory circulating about its potential real-world connections. I just finished playing Resident Evil, and I must say it was such a good experience. Before diving into that, I'd like to share my opinion in this first post of mine on how the T-Virus and the events in Resident Evil might actually be inspired by real-life events. First of all, I'm not claiming absolute correctness for this theory, acknowledging that the events in Resident Evil are entirely fictional. My theory proposes that the game's events could be based on real-world occurrences. For instance, the tyrant virus in the game is portrayed as a creation of the nefarious pharmaceutical company, Umbrella Corporation, seemingly developed for biowarfare purposes. Though I may not possess extensive knowledge in biology, it's conceivable that there could be a real-world pharmaceutical company engaging in unethical practices conducting experiments on viruses, bacteria, or cells. Such a corporation might parallel the fictional umbrella company, exhibiting a disregard for human life and prioritizing profit over public safety. As we're aware, Kishin has expanded its business into various sectors, including games, toys, films, cable channels, and even phones. It's indeed a rapidly growing company, suggesting they might be privy to societal secrets unbeknownst to the common folk. Imagine if Kishin uncovers an unethical pharmaceutical company conducting experiments on biological weapons for the government. The virus they're experimenting with could have effects similar to the T-virus in the game Resident Evil. Being an upright company, Kishin might have decided to alert the public through their new game. It just struck me that the setting of the Resident Evil game resembles a suburban area in the USA. This implies that the mentioned pharmaceutical company might be conducting its experiments in an unassuming location within the United States. I reached this conclusion due to the potential existence of a T-virus in reality. 
We need to be cautious, and the disturbing fact that certain pharmaceutical companies are overcharging for drugs, prioritizing profits over humanity, is deeply unsettling. As Andrea reads the post, a chill runs down her spine. At 16, the thought of a Resident Evil scenario being plausible shakes her to the core. With her right hand on the mouse, she feels it gradually turning cold. I must warn my family about this, Andrea mutters, trembling. Chapter 243, Concerns. After I Am Johnny Cage posted a theory about Resident Evil, one rupee, in the discussion forum, fellow fans began sharing similar theories. While these discussions were not widely popular among console gamers initially, only gaining traction within the Kishin website community, the buzz gradually spread through word of mouth to friends and families of console gamers. Even though some of these friends or family members hadn't played Resident Evil, their curiosity led them to experience the game. After playing and encountering the theories, they too started feeling a sense of unease. While Resident Evil theories were gaining popularity within the console gaming and Resident Evil player community, it's worth noting that theories about other games existed before Resident Evil. However, these earlier theories didn't delve into real-life implications or pose potential dangers, unlike Resident Evil's theory, which touches on public safety. Consequently, this particular theory slowly but surely gained momentum. As a few weeks passed, the situation became more serious than I Am Johnny Cage initially anticipated before making the post. Dash. Meanwhile, Shin found himself at home engrossed in a game of Super Mario with his child, blissfully unaware that his company, Kishin, was slowly becoming entangled in a conspiracy theory involving bioweapons, biowarfare, and virus experimentation by a pharmaceutical company similar to the T-Virus of Resident Evil. Ironically, Kishin emerged as a societal hero for issuing a warning through their game Resident Evil. Oops. Game over. Shin chuckled as his child's palm landed on his cheek. I guess you've won the milk this time, Shin conceded, handing over a bottle to Shinichi in a playful sign of defeat. While enjoying this moment with his child, Shin's phone interrupted the scene. Without much thought, he answered, Hello, what do you want? Recognizing it was Oreo Masayoshi, he spoke informally, having grown accustomed to Oreo Masayoshi, much like with Han Lee. Mr. Suzuki, I'm not sure if you're aware, but we might be facing some trouble at the moment. Oreo Masayoshi's voice conveyed concern. Shin frowned and asked, What do you mean? Dash. Oreo Masayoshi, situated in the USA, occupied his office while glancing at the newspaper spread across his desk. The headline read, Zombie Outbreak? After the release of the KS-1 by Kishin in the USA, it quickly became a hot topic among video game enthusiasts. While the KS-1 video games gained significant attention, the most controversial one, just a few weeks post-release, was undoubtedly Resident Evil. What stirred the controversy? It originated in the community forum of the Kishin website, concerning a virus element reminiscent of Resident Evil. Below the headline, a series of words explained the situation. What do you mean? Shin inquired over Oreo Masayoshi's phone. Mr. Suzuki, it's about our video game, Resident Evil. Oreo Masayoshi began, proceeding to outline the unfolding circumstances to Shin. Dash. As Shin held the phone to his right ear, he absorbed Oreo Masayoshi's explanation, unable to suppress a furrowed brow. How did it come to this situation? How did it escalate to the point where even newspaper companies are covering it? Don't they have more pressing stories to attend to? Shin inquired with a hint of disbelief in his voice. It's connected to Kishin, Mr. Suzuki. As you're aware, our company holds a high profile, engaging in various ventures. Other media outlets and newspapers find it hard to overlook anything that casts us in a negative light, Oreo Masayoshi explained, pausing for emphasis. He continued, furthermore, news involving a virus capable of turning people into zombies sells well among the general public. Shin acknowledged the validity of Oreo Masayoshi's words, stating, that's quite reasonable. Human instincts gravitate toward intriguing topics like that. Indeed, negative news tends to spread faster and wider than positive news. It's unsurprising that newspaper publishers seized the opportunity to disseminate information about the supposed zombie outbreak. They could have merely expressed their opinions on the matter without confirming its truth, allowing readers to decide for themselves. However, this approach fueled the rapid growth in popularity. One of the tactics employed by these newspaper publishers was to refrain from completely debunking the matter. This strategy aimed to prolong the discussion, and as the topic reached more people, it ensured longer profitability for the publishers, with readers eagerly anticipating updates on the latest news. Sigh. I guess it's happened. We'll just handle it according to the situation. I never thought people would entertain such thoughts about a game, Shin sighed. Mr. Suzuki, it could have a negative impact on our KS1 and video game sales. Not only that, our reputation might suffer due to the perception that we somehow caused public unrest, Oreo Masayoshi hurriedly reminded Shin. Shin, upon hearing this, smiled and remarked, you have a point. He paused to gently place his sleeping child, who had fallen asleep while drinking from a bottle, on the soft sofa. Sitting beside his peacefully sleeping child, he continued speaking into the phone, it could indeed have a negative impact on our product sales and reputation. However, how it affects us depends on Kishin's reactions. Shin noticed Oreo Masayoshi's silence, briefly thinking the call had ended. Upon realizing it was still connected, he continued, as you know, this zombie outbreak topic is spreading because of these newspaper companies. We're not the cause of this unrest. 
Moreover, if you're interviewed by the media, don't overly defend yourself, it might raise suspicion. Just speak naturally and avoid showing too much concern. Instead of worrying, let's view this problem as an opportunity and capitalize on the free promotion these newspapers are giving us. Shin chuckled as he spoke. Oreo Masayoshi, hearing this, sighed and eased up. He replied, I understand. Chapter 244, Inadvertent Assistance. The Resident Evil theory has gained widespread attention since its publication in the newspaper. American reactions vary some feel scared, some find it amusing, others think it's foolish, and some remain indifferent. Nonetheless, it has instigated a significant amount of panic, particularly concerning the T-virus. This virus, capable of transforming people into carriers, raises concerns about potential experiments by pharmaceutical companies for biological weapons. This fear extends to those unfamiliar with Resident Evil, especially among non-console gamers. We should urge the government to take action for public safety, remarked a thin elderly man reading the newspaper during a family outing. Oh, come on, dad. That news is two days old, it's probably outdated, the man in his 30s interjected. Even if it's from two days ago, the possibility of a pharmaceutical company experimenting with such a virus, disregarding human life, is still a cause for concern at this very moment, the old man insisted, dismissing the newspaper issue. Shaking his head, the man in his 30s turned to his wife and children, preparing to set up the barbecue. The old man approached them and cautioned, I warned you this outing could be dangerous. Zombies might be roaming around out there. The man in his 30s and his wife exchanged glances, shaking their heads. You're being paranoid, dad, he sighed. That's right, dad. I don't think there's any need to worry, the man's wife reassured. I'm telling you, these are usually the words of people before they get hunted down by zombies, the old man insisted seriously. He added, I couldn't leave you alone, so I joined this outing and brought some weapons we could use later. Zombies, the three children exclaimed, too excitedly while the other showed fear. You're scaring the children, dad, the man in his 30s shook his head. Let's hunt zombies, grandpa. Let's go. I'm so scared. Dash. Meanwhile, after profiting from the zombie-related news, the newspaper publishers released more updates on the Resident Evil T-Virus, Kishin, and pharmaceutical companies. It triggered a minor public alarm, and the Resident Evil theory found its way to several media outlets. Zombie outbreak? Is it truly plausible? Questioned an anchor in front of the camera. He continued, should you prepare a shelter to ensure your safety and possibly your families against this crisis? Let's find out with the coverage from Andrew Ark. The scene shifted to Andrew Ark, standing in front of the camera, who explained, there's news circulating about a virus possibly being developed by pharmaceutical companies that could turn people into zombies. It originated from a horror-themed video game centered around zombies. The coverage on Resident Evil unfolded. Dash. As media outlets continued to cover the Resident Evil theory featured by newspaper publishers. With the news spreading, more and more people gradually became aware of the theory, sparking curiosity, fear, or paranoia. Kishin also came into the public eye due to this situation, as their video game initiated theories surrounding the zombie outbreak news. Some individuals became increasingly wary of pharmaceutical companies possibly experimenting with such a virus. Subsequently, certain media outlets approached Kishin regarding the situation. Kishin's representative, Oreo Masayoshi, responded, We never anticipated that our fictional video game, Resident Evil, would lead to such a situation in this country. Our video game is intended solely for the entertainment and joy of those who enjoy gaming. The fear generated by a theory about our video game, covered by newspapers and media outlets, is not our intention. This response from Kishin emphasizes that their video games are meant for entertainment, disclaiming any intent to harm the public. They attribute the panic among the masses to the actions of newspapers publishers and media outlets. Many people aligned with Kishin's response, believing that the company bears no responsibility for the situation. Due to Kishin's response, media coverage faintly pointed blame at the company in their discussion of the zombie outbreak. There was a subtle suggestion that Kishin, a Japanese company, intentionally caused panic in the USA through the storyline of their video game Resident Evil, set in USA suburban areas. However, this insinuation didn't significantly impact Kishin, as some viewers believed the company was merely issuing a warning and delivering a message to the public. Interestingly, the media's accusations had little adverse effect on Kishin, in fact, it bolstered their sales of KS1 and other video games. Particularly, Resident Evil, the focal point of attention, gained immense popularity, even reaching individuals not typically interested in video games. Although Resident Evil was the catalyst for theories about viruses and zombies, it was the newspapers' publishers and media outlets that ultimately propagated the news. This unintentionally led to increased recognition and sales for Kishin in the USA. As a consequence, within a few days, newspaper publishers and media outlets ceased coverage of topics related to Resident Evil and zombie theories. Recognizing that it would remain a hot topic, they refrained from spreading such news. They understood that not only would Kishin be implicated, but the company would also profit from the situation and outcome the publishers and outlets were keen to avoid, especially after Kishin plainly stated that it was the newspaper's publishers and media outlets themselves who spread panic through these theories. Dash. Meanwhile, Shin examined the IBM Simon personal communicator. 
Shin couldn't deny that IBM's attempt at a touchscreen and portable device was commendable, but its exorbitant price destined it for a swift failure, roughly a thousand dollars. It's quite good, but who would spend a grand on this when they could buy a cellular phone? Shin mused while toying with the IBM Simon personal communicator. As he explored the device, Shin received the sales report for Kishin in the USA following the coverage of Resident Evil and zombie outbreak theories by newspapers and media outlets. Upon hearing the report from Oreo Masayoshi on the phone, Shin smiled and remarked, Hee hee, we can't thank the media enough for their inadvertent assistance. Oreo Masayoshi responded with a moment of silence. Chapter 245, Sport Games the surge in KS1 sales resulted from the widespread news about the zombie outbreak, Resident Evil virus theories, and even those initially uninterested in video games developed an interest due to recent intriguing theories and news. While Resident Evil theories first surfaced in Japan, the intensity was not as high as in the USA, where newspapers and media outlets started covering it. Though the possibility of a pharmaceutical company developing a virus exists, it won't be to the same extent as the T-virus in Resident Evil. Despite differing beliefs in the USA, many still thought a T-virus could be possible. Regardless, while discussions and overthinking persisted, it only contributed to the popularity of KS1 and Resident Evil. Dash. The Tora Suzuki Alliance organized a conference room where Idori Tanaka and Tora executives discussed matters with Shiko Suzuki and Suzuki executives. They discussed the negotiation process for the FIFA Association licensing agreement, aiming to adapt their football FIFA sports into a video game. We've heard that Kishin is ahead in negotiating with the FIFA Association for the licensing agreement, an executive stated with a serious expression. It's Kishin. They're planning to exclusively own the licensing rights for FIFA adaptation games. Fortunately, we contacted FIFA expressing our interest before Kishin's negotiations with FIFA were finalized, another executive added. It's a good thing we have Mr. Idori Tanaka to suggest negotiating with FIFA, another executive nodded. Football is the most popular sport globally, so it's not surprising for Kishin to negotiate with the Football Association for licensing with the intention of adapting it into their video game, Idori Tanaka said with a smile. Shiko and Seiki, also in the meeting, exchanged glances, acknowledging Idori Tanaka's competence. In fact, long before Kishin had KES and SKES, they signed an agreement with football associations in Japan for video game adaptations. While Tora and Suzuki had already adapted football video games into their consoles, Kishin aimed to negotiate a licensing agreement with the FIFA Association on an international scale, involving millions of dollars in licensing alone. Tora Suzuki Alliance later joined the negotiations with the same intention of adapting FIFA into a video game in the future. Dash. Upon receiving the report that Tora Suzuki Alliance had joined the negotiations to acquire FIFA licensing rights, Shin smiled. Well, it doesn't matter if Kishin doesn't become the exclusive partner and adaptation provider for the FIFA sports game. Regardless, even if FIFA signs licensing agreements with both Kishin and Tora Suzuki for video game adaptations, it will be a competition to see whose football game quality prevails between Kishin and Tora Suzuki. Besides, FIFA isn't the only organization Shin has Kishin negotiating for sports games adaptations into video games. Did they just forget about basketball and wrestling? Shin muttered as he shook his head. Dash. In Zurich, Switzerland, at the FIFA Association headquarters, a Kishin representative negotiates with the FIFA representative. They negotiate the licensing agreement for video game adaptations, and Kishin also negotiates for the manufacturing of FIFA merchandise with their Kishin merchandise. While FIFA aims to maximize profits by securing agreements with both Kishin and Tora Suzuki, they attempt to raise the price for the licensing. The negotiations extended over a few weeks before finally signing a licensing agreement with both Kishin and Tora Suzuki for video game adaptations. The difference is that Kishin will be able to sell FIFA merchandise under their Kishin merchandise, but, of course, this entails another licensing agreement, resulting in Kishin paying additional fees. Dash. While the Tora Suzuki Alliance focused on FIFA negotiations, Kishin was engaged in talks with the NBA, the currently popular basketball association in the USA. Undoubtedly, the most popular basketball player in the world at the moment was Michael Jordan. Even those unfamiliar with basketball knew Michael Jordan. The peak of Jordan's popularity in basketball was probably in 1986 to 1987 and 1992. In 1986, Michael Jordan's gravity-defying dunks in the NBA Slam Dunk Contest became globally popular, even inspiring a certain mangaka in Japan. In 1987, Jordan led the Bulls to a championship, and in 1992, he played for the Dream Team in the Olympic basketball team. As time passed, now in 1994, although the NBA, Michael Jordan, and basketball remained popular, the global discussion about them had diminished compared to before. With Michael Jordan's retirement, the basketball superstar stepping down from the spotlight, even though basketball remained widely popular and fans continued to follow NBA updates, those less interested in basketball gradually stopped talking about it. Currently, Kishin seized the opportunity presented by this situation. Shin understood that negotiating with the NBA in 1992 or 1993, when Michael Jordan hadn't retired, and the NBA was still hot with Jordan's presence, would have cost Kishin a few million dollars more for licensing rights. 
However, anticipating Michael Jordan's return in 1995, Shin planned to negotiate an exclusive licensing agreement for video game adaptations and merchandise, possibly extending the contract for a few more years. Until then, even when the NBA regained popularity due to Michael Jordan's return the following year, Kishin would maintain an ongoing contract with the NBA, eliminating the need for renewal. In a few more weeks, while the Mortal Kombat box office success steadily rivaled The Lion King, with screenings in Europe and Asia, the global gross reached about 680 million. Despite some countries banning the film due to its violence and gore, Mortal Kombat still achieved significant success. Warner Brothers and Universal Studios could only share a moment of silence as they witnessed the box office results of Mortal Kombat. Creator's Thoughts Chapter 246, Well Played The Kishin and NBA engaged in extensive negotiations before finalizing their agreement, which, unlike FIFA, hasn't been publicly disclosed yet. Simultaneously, Kishin is planning to negotiate a licensing agreement with WWE. Despite WWE's existing widespread popularity, Kishin merchandise's sales of wrestlers action figures and toys are thriving. The golden age of WWE concluded in 1993 after a peak from 1980. Despite the end of the golden era in 1994, WWE remains popular. However, this year marked a decline as key stars departed, and factors like alternative entertainment such as video games and the internet affected WWE's ratings and overall popularity. The problem extends beyond what meets the eye, involving internal conflicts within WWE that we don't need to delve into further. Meanwhile, WCW and ECW introduced a new generation of wrestlers. Under Warner Brothers, WCW emerged as a significant competitor in the entertainment industry, posing a challenge to the struggling WWE. Financial constraints added to WWE's difficulties. Seizing the moment, Shinro Suzuki saw an opportunity. He dispatched Kishin representatives led by Oreo Masayoshi to negotiate with WWE for licensing agreements, encompassing future video game adaptations and merchandise. On December 23, 1994, representatives from WWE engaged in discussions with Kishin representatives regarding these negotiations. The WWE higher UPS believed they could capitalize on the situation by raising prices, emphasizing past glory and popularity to the Kishin Japanese representatives. Kishimoto Yuki, a Japanese woman in a sleek black suit befitting a businesswoman, adjusted her glasses while listening to the vice president of global licensing highlighting WWE's popularity in the United States. After he finished, Yuki remarked, WWE is indeed popular not only in the USA but worldwide. However, the departure of key wrestlers and the rise of other wrestling tournaments have impacted its popularity. Moreover, WWE's primary audience, the younger demographic, is increasingly turning to video games for entertainment. Upon hearing this, the WWE vice president of global licensing and other executives felt a sense of complexity. It was a valid point, they recognized the growing influence of video games, gradually drawing away their younger audience. Yuki adjusted her glasses, smiling with charm, and added, We are taking a financial risk in seeking the WWE license, hoping to adapt WWE wrestling into a video game with no guarantees of success. However, if our Kishin adaptation of the WWE video game becomes successful, it could boost WWE's popularity. Not only that, but the young audience that initially switched to video games may return to support the WWE franchise once more. Another Kishin representative, alongside Kishimoto Yuki, nodded in agreement, stating, That's right it's a win-win situation for both of us. The WWE vice president of global licensing and the executives exchanged glances, and the WWE representative, appearing hesitant, reluctantly agreed to the Kishin licensing agreement. Kishimoto Yuki, a key Kishin executive in the USA, and the other representatives smiled. With that settled, the signing of the WWE licensing agreement with Kishin was completed in just a few days. Dash. Shin smiled as he watched the cable news on CNN. On the television screen, Oreo Masayoshi and the CEO of the NBA were displaying a basketball jersey together at a press conference. The camera flashed on Oreo Masayoshi's smiling Japanese face. Kishin and NBA have just entered a partnership, with Kishin acquiring licensing rights for the entire NBA franchise. While it's mentioned that Kishin merchandise will manufacture toys and action figures of NBA players, the complete details of the Kishin and NBA partnership are yet to be fully disclosed. The reporter's voice echoed through the television. Shin grinned broadly as he continued enjoying his coffee jelly. You seem to be in a good mood. Myra's voice remarked as she observed Shin's handsome smile while he sat casually on the sofa, savoring his coffee jelly. I'm just in a good mood, Shin replied, pulling Myra closer to him. Kia. Myra feigned innocence as she was drawn nearer to Shin. Oh, you're role-playing, huh? Shin chuckled, playfully teasing. Dash. Meanwhile, in the CEO office at Tora Electronics headquarters, Idari Tanaka studied the report brought in by his secretary with a solemn expression. The Kishin and NBA Partnership. Although the official statement mentioned manufacturing NBA franchise merchandise at Kishin Merchandise, Idari Tanaka could discern that Kishin was likely planning to adapt the NBA franchise basketball sports game into a video game. The Tora Suzuki Alliance seemed to have shifted their focus away from basketball, and Kishin capitalized on the situation, now holding the exclusive rights to the NBA franchise license. 
This left them in a complex situation. Despite recently acquiring the licensing agreement for FIFA, the current top football game globally, basketball was the third most popular sport worldwide. Given the NBA's status as the major association for basketball in the USA, its significance was evident. Now, Kishin had secured the licensing for this crucial association. Damn it, Idari Tanaka shook his head and muttered, it looks like Tora can only pursue an NBA licensing agreement when their contract ends. Simultaneously, Idari Tanaka pondered whether a parody basketball game for their console, currently in final development, could be a viable alternative. Dash. After Kishin acquired the NBA licensing, the long-developed Kishin SKES video game that hadn't found its way to the market was promptly released NBA Jam. NBA Jam had been developed by Kishin under Shin's leadership for pure enjoyment. However, with the NBA still at its peak popularity, Shin didn't pursue licensing immediately. Just a few weeks after Kishin became the NBA licensee, Shin released NBA Jam for SKES. Although KS1 was Kishin's new console, SKES had a larger player base than KS1 at the moment. The game for SKES continued to sell well, and with Kishin's extensive video game library on SKES, it wasn't an overstatement to say that SKES was the most popular console in 1994. As Kishin worked on developing an NBA video game for KS1, the NBA Jam on SKES served as a suitable interim option. Additionally, the NBA franchise in Kishin merchandise was expected to generate profits in the meantime. Likewise, a similar situation applied to the FIFA game for SKES. While the Taurus Suzuki Alliance was in the process of developing a FIFA game for their finalized console, Kishin was already well prepared and had a strategic advantage in the market. Chapter 247, Virtual Racing The NBA Jam at SKES gained swift popularity among NBA fans. While some thought its release right after the Kishin and NBA partnership was hasty, many considered it normal for Kishin, the current industry leader, to develop a game so quickly. Kishin, led by well-known game developer Shinro Suzuki, held a prominent position in the gaming circle. Dash. A man, Chris, was engrossed in playing SKES NBA Jam with his younger brother, Lewis. Come on, pick your team, Chris urged his eight-year-old brother. I'll choose the Bulls. Watch how I make MJ dunk against your team. Lewis boasted. All right, let's see Michael Jackson dunk while moonwalking, Chris teased, chuckling. It's Michael Jordan. Lewis corrected. Chris chuckled as he faced the screen, it was a two-player game, and now it was his turn to choose a team after his brother had selected the Chicago Bulls. I have a soft spot for the underdog, so I'll go with the New York Knicks, Chris decided. New York Knicks? Are you sure about that, Chris? Get ready to lose this time, Lewis teased with a hint of surprise. Don't get too confident, Chris replied, feeling assured despite his choice of a seemingly weaker team. After a match, Chris was left speechless as his younger brother emerged victorious. That's what you get for picking the New York Knicks, Lewis laughed. I just lost on purpose, Chris admitted, slightly embarrassed. I chose the Knicks because I enjoy losing, so, enough with the excuses, Lewis chuckled. Dash. Meanwhile, even with the latest console KS1, Kishin continued to exhilarate fans with SKES games after the NBA Jam release. Due to the current backward state of game development in this world's video game industry, Kishin, along with Tora Suzuki, stood as the sole frontrunner. With most top-notch games under their belt, Kishin had agreements with various video game entertainment companies to develop games for KS1, a process that was already underway. In the realm of KS1 video game development, despite the advanced VG engine for the toolkit, creating a game still required several months. The timeline depended on the type of game being developed and the size of the game development team. For a monumental project like Final Fantasy VII, in Shin's past life, it could even take years, even with VG engine. However, Kishin's KS1 video game development progressed efficiently, thanks to Shin's pre-planning. He provided a basic idea and rough storyline from his previous life to the game development department, allowing the developers to handle the rest. As Shin examined the incomplete games, he found them meeting his expectations and, in some cases, surpassing them. The results were even deemed superior to the PS1 games from his previous life. Dash. Simultaneously, arcades in certain parts of Tokyo became the first to showcase Kishin's latest arcade machines. Arcades served as the gamer's hub, offering a space to discuss their interests in specific video games at a time when the internet was not yet common. In a particular arcade, gamers engaged in playing video games, watching, or discussing when the latest Kishin arcade machines were being set up in the arcade section. Look, new Kishin arcade machines. I wonder what they are. Is that a steering wheel? The installation of the latest Kishin arcade machines sparked discussions among the gamers. Upon noticing a steering wheel in front of the screen on the arcade cabinet, they speculated it must be a racing arcade. With this assumption, excitement rippled through the group. As expected, once the Kishin video game arcade machines became available to gamers, they eagerly took turns trying them out. They were not disappointed, the arcade was dedicated to racing, specifically the need for speed. Remarkably, the graphics surpassed those of KS1. While the need for speed arcade was already known, the enhanced controls with a steering wheel and superior graphics of the new racing arcade game were a significant improvement. The design of the video game arcade cabinet featured cars and a word written in both Japanese and English, virtual racing. 
The name of the video game Arcade Machines was Virtual Racing. Gamers immersed in virtual racing felt the satisfaction and excitement of driving a car, particularly given the realistic sensation provided by the steering wheel. This experience was especially impactful for gamers who hadn't yet had the opportunity to drive a real car. Gamers had the option to switch between the third-person perspective camera and the immersive driver's seat perspective inside the car. The in-car perspective offered a significantly more realistic experience, enhancing gamers' immersion in the racing or driving gameplay. Dash. Kishin introduced a cutting-edge arcade machine focused on racing cars. Not only did it boast superior graphics, thanks to an advanced but incomplete 3D technology, but its controls were also notably improved. Achieving such graphics required a complex and larger machine, making it exclusive to arcades. This technology's capabilities couldn't yet be replicated in portable forms like home video game consoles. The video game featured in virtual racing was an enhanced version of the Need for Speed. Dash. It was December 1994, with the arrival of 1995 on the horizon. While it marked a new beginning for some, not everyone shared the same sentiment. For Tora Suzuki, the completion of their home game console was imminent. They sensed that the time to counterattack against the industry leader, Kishin, was drawing near. As Kishin ascended to the pinnacle of the video game industry, some fans of Tora Suzuki began viewing them as a demon king seeking to monopolize the industry. This sentiment was echoed by certain video game entertainment companies who harbored displeasure towards Kishin. Creators Thog. Chapter 248, Kishin Foundation. Around January 2, 1995, Shin found himself grappling with a sense of melancholy. During this period, a recollection surfaced in Shin's mind a premonition of an impending, more devastating earthquake set to strike Japan. According to Shin's memory, this catastrophe was anticipated for January 1995 in Hyogo Prefecture, where thousands were destined to perish or suffer injuries. In this alternate reality, Shin harbored uncertainty about the tragedy's certainty, but recent seismic activities in Japan between 1990 and 1994 heightened his concern. Just the previous October, in 1994, an earthquake in certain part of Japan had already occurred. Aware of the potential for a calamitous earthquake resulting in hundreds of billions of dollars in damages and casualties, Shin acknowledged Japan's historical efforts to establish building standards after the 1923 tragedy. However, even with advancements in earthquake-resistant construction, the technology was still evolving. Despite Kobe City's predominantly earthquake-resistant structures, the looming Great Hanshin earthquake would test their resilience. Notably, certain buildings, whether from corporations or the Japanese government, stood as exceptions incorporating advanced design techniques, materials, and a base isolation system that fortified them against seismic impacts. Therefore, despite Shin's somber feelings about the potential casualties caused by the looming 1995 earthquake, he wasn't overly concerned about significant damage befalling his branch company buildings in Kobe City or Hyogo Prefecture, Japan. This confidence stemmed from Shin's substantial investment in constructing his company's buildings, incorporating advanced design, a base isolation system, and materials for enhanced earthquake resistance. Essentially, his structures mirrored the seismic resilience of other corporate buildings across Japan. Looks like the Kishin Foundation I recently established will need to prepare. Shin muttered, gazing out at the city from the top floor with transparent glass. Flashback. Around November 1994, Shin grappled with a sense of unease regarding the impending 1995 earthquake in this parallel world. Uncertain about its certainty, Shin felt compelled to take action after a significant earthquake hit a certain part of Japan in October. Reflecting on the need for proactive measures, he mused, Looks like I need to create a Kishin Foundation to help and provide assistance if such a thing were to ever happen. But I hope it will not, tapping his fingers on his office desk. Shin had contemplated this decision for a considerable time, but recent busyness and financial constraints had delayed the initiation of the foundation he had envisioned. Now, amidst the looming threat of a potential tragedy, Shin finally resolved to launch the Preplond Foundation. In the upcoming Kishin Rules meeting, where Shin occupied the head chair, key executives like Han Li, who had chosen to work in Japan instead of being the president of Kishin Asia in Taiwan, were present. These executives had proven their capabilities, competence, and worth to Kishin. Initially, everyone anticipated the discussion of the usual business plan portfolio, outlining Kishin's actions, marketing strategies, and the direction of companies under Kishin Rules in the conference room's expansive space. However, during the meeting, Shinro Suzuki unexpectedly interrupted the proceedings. Ladies and gentlemen, I have an idea to propose today that requires swift and immediate action, he declared. A hush fell over the room as all eyes turned to Chairman Shin, curious about the nature of his proposal. With clasped hands and elbows resting on the round table, Shin, wearing a serious expression, announced, Today, I am declaring that Kishin Rules will create a foundation company, Kishin Foundation, as soon as possible. The announcement caught everyone off guard, and a sense of surprise permeated the room. Mr. Suzuki, please don't take offense, but I find this proposal a bit sudden, Han Lee voiced with a hint of reluctance. That's right, Mr. Suzuki. While establishing a foundation company is not an issue, doing it hastily today without a well-thought-out plan and execution seems impractical. Even with a plan, I doubt its feasibility, hurriedly remarked another executive. 
and, Mr. Suzuki, setting up a foundation company involves a complex process that requires meticulous planning and execution. A thoughtfully crafted plan ensures the foundation company is properly structured with the necessary resources to achieve its goals, nodded Han Li. Shin smiled, observing the key executives of Kishin Rules proficiently addressing the situation. They seemed to doubt his preparedness for establishing the Kishin Foundation promptly. Of course, I'm not suggesting that the Kishin Foundation be established today. What I mean is to initiate the process as soon as possible, Shin replied with a faint smile, pausing before adding, I've also prepared a plan. Here are the documents specifically tailored for turning this idea into reality as quickly as possible, as he tossed a stack of papers onto the center of the round table. Executives exchanged glances before some of them reached for the small stack of documents, finding ample copies for everyone to peruse the chairman's plan. Han Li received a document from a junior, nodding appreciatively before studying its contents. The document detailed Shin's ideas and plans, featuring the Kishin Foundation logo resembling the familiar Kishin iconic emblem. Initially, the key executives had assumed Chairman Shinro Suzuki aimed to establish a foundation company for tax benefits. However, as they delved deeper into the documents, they couldn't help but be surprised by the thoroughness of Shin's ideas and plans. One notable initiative involved the development and promotion of educational video games designed to be both entertaining and enriching for children. The foundation aimed to enhance children's cognitive skills, problem-solving abilities, and social skills through these games. Supporting research on the utilization of video games for education and social good entails investigating how video games can effectively teach children various skills, including math, science, and reading. Additionally, video games can play a role in fostering social skills such as teamwork and cooperation. The foundation is committed to providing grants to organizations utilizing video games to aid children. For instance, grants have been extended to organizations using video games to educate children about health and nutrition, assist children with disabilities, and promote peace and understanding between different cultures. The focus on supporting children, orphans, and those with disabilities through video games struck the key executives as somewhat inconsequential, given Kishin's identity as a video game-centric corporation. Moreover, there was a comprehensive plan addressing calamities and tragedies. The Kishin Foundation aimed to provide immediate relief, support long-term recovery, advocate for disaster preparedness and mitigation, promote mental health and trauma healing, support research and innovation, and more. The key executives found themselves somewhat bewildered. While they could comprehend a foundation related to video games for children, the inclusion of disaster-related initiatives seemed unexpectedly generous from Shinro Suzuki. The chairman remains as kind and soft-hearted as ever, mused some key executives, including Lee Han. With the ambitious goals outlined for the Kishin Foundation, the process of establishment would likely take a few weeks or months. Simultaneously, the key executives anticipated busy days ahead of them. Chapter 249, Quick Response In January, Shin directed the Kishin Foundation to prepare in Kobe City. The foundation's employees, though initially confused, had to follow the orders, as Shinro Suzuki, despite Myra being the CEO, held authority. On January 16, 1995, Japan was shocked by a devastating earthquake that struck Kobe City and spread to the Hyogo Prefecture. The earthquake caused significant damage, affecting thousands of people, resulting in injuries and thousands of casualties. Additionally, it inflicted extensive damage to infrastructure, including roads, bridges, and buildings. The earthquake caused a complete disruption of both communication and transportation systems, severely hindering a prompt and timely system response. This incident took everyone by surprise, and despite the Japanese government's efforts in response and deploying rescue teams, it still took hours before they reached the affected areas. As media outlets covered the situation, Japanese viewers were astonished to see Kishin being the first to assist and help the injured people. NHK, a news outlet, captured the moment when a Kishin Foundation rescue team acted swiftly, providing relief foods and medical assistance to the affected people. I'm currently in Higashinada, where a corporate rescue team acted swiftly to provide assistance, reported Yumi Yamamoto, capturing the Kishin Foundation vehicle on camera. Approaching an injured man, Yumi interviewed him. Despite his devastation, he expressed gratitude towards Kishin Foundation, emphasizing that their immediate help prevented his family from being stuck in their house. Yumi then interviewed a Kishin Foundation rescuer who admitted, This is the first time I've learned about Kishin having a foundation company. Despite my recent awareness, I was surprised by the foundation's quick response. It might be naive to ask, but can you share how Kishin Foundation was able to respond so promptly? With a serious expression, the rescuer replied, Kishin Foundation has highly trained professionals with expertise in search and rescue, medical care, and disaster response. Additionally, we recently established rapid response teams around the city, explaining in a series of words. Japanese viewers were impressed by the Kishin Foundation's swift response in the situation. Within a few hours, Kishin Foundation not only provided a response but did so even quicker than the government. As days passed, 7-11 and other retail companies, along with major corporations like Tora, Suzuki, Toyota, Mitsubishi, extended help to the affected people. While their contributions were appreciated, Kishin Foundation's rapid actions garnered high praise both nationally and internationally in the aftermath of the earthquake disaster. 
In contrast, the government faced some criticism among the Japanese people. Despite their response within a few hours and dispatching rescue teams to affected areas, issues like food shortages and medical supplies still needed attention. Fortunately, Kishin Foundation stepped in, alleviating the government's pressure. What frustrated most Japanese citizens was the government's refusal to accept foreign aid, causing delays in providing additional assistance. I didn't expect that a company like Kishin could provide so much help, lamented a viewer at home. Yeah, I thought they were just a video game company, but they managed something our government couldn't, sighed a middle-aged man. I heard that Kishin Foundation had a rapid response team or standby rescue team around the city of Kobe even before the earthquake happened, the middle-aged woman said. I know. I can say that Kishin Foundation is meticulous and prepared, as if they're vigilant against such situations. Seriously, our government should learn from Kishin Foundation, the middle-aged man nodded as he spoke. If Shin knew what people thought of Kishin Foundation, even comparing it to the government, he would probably shake his head helplessly. Without future knowledge, he would likely be as clueless as everyone else. After Kishin Foundation's quick response, its reputation soared nationally and internationally, with media outlets emphasizing its significant contribution. Other corporations, mostly Japanese companies, received appreciation from both the Japanese government and the people for their assistance. Surprisingly, even the number one Yakuza gang, Yamauchi Gumi, provided great assistance to the affected. Meanwhile, those managing Kishin Foundation couldn't help but think of Shinro Suzuki. It was Shinro Suzuki who emphasized focusing their response rescue teams around the city of Kobe and some parts of Hyogo Prefecture. The managers of Kishin Foundation couldn't help but talk about this. Initially confused about why Shinro Suzuki would order the foundation to set up rescue teams around the city of Kobe and some parts of Hyogo Prefecture, now, a devastating earthquake occurred in the very area where the teams were stationed. The managers felt a chill just thinking about it, and now, they were discussing this remarkable coincidence. Some speculated that Shinro Suzuki might have some powers and sensed the earthquake threat, leading to ridiculous theories circulating among the higher UPS of Kishin Foundation. Dash. The Kishin Foundation has received quite a praise these days. You've founded such a helpful company, Myra said to Shin, who was currently watching the news on TV. Myra, the current Kishin Foundation CEO, possessed a soft and kind heart, aiming to help people through the foundation company. You're right. But you've helped and managed the Kishin Foundation very well, Shin smiled and replied. But I'm quite sad, you know. Many people were affected, Myra tried to smile but couldn't, given the horrible disaster she had witnessed from the helicopter. Sensing the mood getting heavier, Shin remarked, I heard some unpleasant rumors about me and your Kishin Foundation. Myra was a bit surprised but smiled lightly, saying, who can blame them? It's your fault that you gave orders for such weird things, like the establishment of rapid rescue teams around Hyogo Prefecture that actually managed to save many lives. It's such a coincidence. She paused and then recounted the rumors, mentioning, the rumors of you having some powers. She continued, recounting more and more. Shin felt a sweat running down his back as he heard Myra's recounting of the rumors. Shin chuckled slightly, finding people's imaginations both weird and expansive. Those rumors are just a product of their imagination, Shin said, looking at Myra. Really? I felt they made sense, Myra teased. Don't fool around, Shin shook his head, focusing on watching the TV. Chapter 250, Latest. Kishin Foundation successfully saved thousands during the earthquake, earning praise from both the people and the government. On television, a news report highlighted the Kishin Foundation's assistance during the devastating event in Hyogo Prefecture and Kobe City. Shiko watched the report on television and couldn't help but comment, the company is receiving praise again. Dash. In Idori Tanaka's office, after watching the news, he shook his head and sighed, saying, not only smart in business but also compassionate. Kenji, who was nearby, remarked, compassionate? I didn't expect you to see him that way. Idori Tanaka chuckled, haha, there's nothing wrong with praising good deeds. I guess so. Kenji replied with a smile. Dash. In the Seizama mansion, Seizama dialed his old friends to brag about his youngest grandson, prompting a sigh from Kumiko. Did you see the news? My youngest grandson, with the Kishin Foundation, has truly made a significant impact? The Suzuki genes are really showing in him. Seizama enthusiastically shared with his old friend Toyota, indulging in a bit of bragging. Yeah, yeah, that's great, Toyota replied somewhat helplessly. What about your youngest grandson? Seizama inquired, aiming to both boast and compare with Toyota. I don't think there's a need to. Toyota hesitated, seemingly reluctant to discuss it. He couldn't bring himself to admit that his youngest grandson spent most of his time at his father's house, watching anime and playing games in his room. Dash. A few months passed after the Great Hanshin earthquake. In the Kishin Rules Conference Room, Shin, along with the executives, deliberated on the various companies under Kishin Rules. Simultaneously, they discussed the Kishin Foundation's contributions to the areas affected by the earthquake. Thanks to the Kishin Foundation's assistance in the areas affected by the Great Hanshin earthquake, our overall reputation at Kishin companies has risen, and public opinion towards Kishin has significantly improved. The sales of our Kishin Rule subsidiary companies have also experienced a slight boost, an executive reported with a positive demeanor. I never anticipated that our Kishin Foundation would have such a positive impact on both the main and subsidiary companies of Kishin, another executive acknowledged with a nod. 
It's all thanks to our chairman for establishing the Kishin Foundation, a foundation with the ultimate goal of helping and assisting those in need, another executive added, smiling and nodding. Li Han nodded in agreement and said, three months have passed since the Great Hanshin earthquake, yet the damage and casualties it inflicted on the people in Hyogo Prefecture are devastating. Shin concurred, saying, while our company's reputation has improved due to the Kishin Foundation, leading to increased sales nationally and internationally, it's crucial to remember that our primary focus is helping people, not just for profit. The executives nodded, exchanging glances, feeling a bit guilty for momentarily prioritizing profits over the welfare of the affected people. Now, enough about that. Mr. Han, how are the negotiations with Samstar progressing? Shin calmly inquired as he looked at Lee Han. Lee Han leads the negotiation team for Kishin in discussions with the South Korean market. He reported, Samstar is insisting on the same terms as our initial agreement. Shin nodded in understanding, while the executives displayed a slight frown. Kishin had been in talks with Samstar for about a week, discussing the distribution of the KS1 and video games in the South Korean market. With a serious expression, Shin advised, then go ahead and agree to it. Shin was familiar with Samstar from his previous life, knowing the company's significant success. Due to this, he was willing to accept their terms, recognizing the importance of establishing connections with them. While Samstar might not be as large as it would become in the future, its current status as a substantial company with a net worth of about $13 billion outweighed Kishin, still a private company, along with Kishin Rules and its subsidiaries valued at around $8 billion. Considering Kishin's relatively short existence since its founding in 1990, these numbers were indeed impressive. Considering that the $8 billion worth of Kishin represented the sole wealth of Shinro Suzuki, given his ownership and control of the company, it could be asserted that Shin might be ranked among the top 100 richest individuals globally if his wealth were ever made public. This evaluation doesn't even factor in Shin's investments in other companies such as WWW, NVIDIA, Rebolt Technology, Apple, Amazon, Pixar, etc. Jeff changed the name of his company for certain reasons. While many of Shin's investments are not yet generating profits, including Rebolt Technology and Apple, some of these companies are poised to become industry giants in the future. For instance, when Jeff required additional funds for Amazon, Shin provided more funding, resulting in Shin gaining a larger share of the company. Furthermore, WWW is also displaying signs of profitability as the Internet's global user base continues to grow, and the use of browsers and websites becomes increasingly evident. There are approximately 25 million online users, a figure significantly underestimated by other companies. Dash. A few months after the release of KS1, Kishin launched several console games. In February, they released Crash Bandicoot and Tomb Raider. Within a few days of their release, both games were also made available in the USA market. Following this, the Castlevania series was introduced to KS1. Castlevania 3 and Super Castlevania were released for SKES and KS1, while Castlevania, Rondo of Blood made its debut on PC and KS1, supporting platforms like Microsoft and Apple. Simultaneously, PC gaming witnessed significant growth. Many people in the USA, even those without internet access, engaged in online play of Warcraft, Orcs and Humans using Kishin's latest software, Kishin Plays, KP, designed to support game matchmaking. With a required internet speed of 28 kbps, players could engage in basic gameplay with others. Hundreds of individuals had already embraced Kishin Plays, purchasing the software CD from the Kishin store. Many Warcraft gamers were among the first to experience online play, marking the emergence of the first generation of PC online gamers.